Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another ASUS PC DIY hardware stream and hopefully everybody is wrapping out their week on a positive and productive footing, staying safe, staying healthy. Uh, we've got of course some exciting things as always to be able to go ahead and jump into. We're going to be talking actually about uh, brand new ProArt series based displays with an actually really exciting 32 inch uh, OLED based monitor that we've actually been working on for quite some time with the PA3T, excuse me, 32DC. Uh, we also are going to have of course an ultra wide in terms of the ProArt series which is going to be pretty cool with the PA3 4 8 CGV. Uh, and the actual, if you don't know, the CGV designation actually means that it's actually going to include both the standard um, kind of ergonomic based hand, uh, stand, but you're also actually going to get our really cool C clamp based design, which is also going to be present in there. Uh, we've also got an update in terms of brand new gaming router that we're going to be having in addition to the ROG Rapture series of high performance uh, wired and wireless gaming routers. We've got some actually UEFI updates for some of you that might be on the AM4 platform that have been waiting for the Agisa 1.2.07 release in terms of kind of the continuing rollout. Of course, also got the PC DIY Builders Spotlight that we're going to be dunching, dumping into. And of course, as always, probably some questions and comments from those that are in uh, the stream. So let's go ahead and see who we have joining us here. All right. Um, Rafin's asking about X670 motherboard announcement. Nothing uh, specifically today. Uh, we have gone ahead and already actually done a little bit of a first look preview on our ROG Crosshair Extreme as well as our ROG Crosshair Hero. You can actually check those out right now on the YouTube channel where we dive in and actually give you a full kind of flyover on the motherboard, talk about some of its features and functions and specifications. Of course, we're going to have a full dedicated live stream for an AM5 series of motherboards when we get closer to the actual launch of the platform. So make sure to keep it tuned uh, for that. Hey, Miguel. Fantastic. Happy to have you here on the stream. Erica, always great to have you here. Thanks so much for letting us know. Audio sounding good as well. Paul, thanks for joining us here. Uh, PGPCs, awesome to have you here. Michael, also joining us here on the stream. I think uh, Sue Min's there. Uh, yep. And there we got Sue Min as well joining us. Johnny Boy, also joining us here on the stream. Thanks so much. Nelson, fantastic to have you here. And uh, also, thanks for having you here. I don't know your name, but I love your uh, <laughs> I love your uh, your character profile. It's, it's a cool little character profile there. All right, so uh, let's get ready to go ahead and jump into things, and we'll get ready to kick things off. Hey, Paskowitz, uh, happy to have you here also on the stream. Uh, very cool, actually, car there also in your actually profile pic. All right, so let's get ready to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, first and foremost, I think I'm actually going to jump into some UEFI BIOS updates. Uh, we haven't actually had too many UEFI BIOS updates uh, recently. We've actually been working a lot in terms of upcoming next generation boards. So that's where a lot of our R&D effort has been in terms of kind of helping to optimize the, you know, the actual um, the aspects that really kind of underlie the core experience of a board, and that's going to be the UEFI. So that's been a lot of where our work is. But um, for some of you that might be running the AM4 based platforms, we have actually been working on continuing to finalize the rollout of our uh, AMD Agisa 1.2.0.7 release. So that essentially is the latest formal release from AMD, which helps to add in things like resolution to FTPM stutter, also helps to um, maximize latest generation support for the newest CPUs, things like, you know, the 5800X3D, um, as well as also, um, you have formalized Windows 11 support if you haven't made, of course, that transition over in terms of that. And there's also a couple of other things in there like USB interoperability and compatibility and enhancement for some users that were experiencing that. So we had already released this update pretty much to almost all 500 series boards, but there are still 300 series and 400 series boards that are still uh, waiting for this update. So I do have actually an update for you in that regard. So let's go ahead and quickly recap on those. And I'll quickly again show you uh, just for reference how that plays out if you do need to go through this UBFI update. And as always, uh, I do stress that essentially, if you're kind of wondering, do I need to update the UEFI BIOS? You do not need to update. If your system is running stable and reliable and without any issues, don't worry about essentially this update. Uh, this is really going to be specifically for one of those use cases uh, or essentially one of those resolutions uh, that I noted a little bit earlier. If you're not in that, then it's not something you have to worry about. Okay, so just something to go ahead and keep in mind in that regard. So uh, let me go ahead and see here. Sorry, actually. Uh, let me resize that just so I can make sure and see it. <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll make a quick a tweet there. There we go. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, let's see, boards that we have in terms of this update, we we're going to have the ROG Crosshair 7 Hero. It has an update. That'll be for both the Wi-Fi and the non-Wi-Fi model. Um, then the ROG X670-i Gaming. And keep in mind, if you guys forget any of these, don't worry about it. We'll have a full formal post in the ASUS PC DIY group either later today or um, I'll put it, maybe put it up tomorrow. And and you guys can actually check our normal kind of full breakdown where we have a full FAQ that also guides you through any kind of things that you're wondering about when it comes to the UBFI BIOS. So 
updates. Uh, B450-E, B450-F, B450-I, um, and B450-F Gaming 2 also is included in there. The Crosshair 6 Extreme gets this update in the Crosshair 6 Hero and the Crosshair 6 Hero Wi-Fi. And so I know definitely those are probably some of the really big boards that people have been finally waiting for for this update to get patched and rolled out. So let's go ahead and quickly take a look and see what that would look like if we were to go ahead and um, make that applicable update. So um, let's, I don't know, I um, guess we can use the ROG Strix B450-F. Um, so let me go ahead and just actually load that up there. 50-F uh, Gaming 2. All right, so I've gone ahead and gone to the site right here. Again, all you need to do to that is just go to the support page. Once you go to the support page, go to drivers and utilities, go to BIOS and firmware, and then uh, you can click on this expand all button. And you can see right there, it uh, notes the AMD Agisa 1.2.0.7 release. And so from there, you would go ahead and download it and be good to go. As always, keep in mind that if you make an update to a much newer Agisa and you're running a much older Agisa, especially if you're doing things like having any type of special overclocks, you may have to actually retune your overclocks clocks to be in alignment with the new Agisa because there can be changes in what are called auto rules and other parameters. So again, we have this all covered in a full FAQ guide in our Asus PC DIY group. So if you're interested in that, just make sure to check out the group. It's linked in the description and it's great space uh, to be able to go ahead and get more information in this regard. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and just see uh, any questions right there that might have popped up. Porsche 917, Pasco says. Oh, very, very cool. Any plans, uh, plans to release a motherboard for the... Uh... Okay, so I think you're actually talking about uh, Threadripper Pro. Um, so yeah, so somebody's actually asking about the Threadripper Pro. So we have actually talked about this in the past, and I believe I did note this in a prior stream where we have already gone ahead and released our UEFI support. Um, so let me actually go ahead and show you right here. Let me see, show you right here. Do I have actually images of it here on my system? I think I do have. If not, I can go ahead and bring it up here. Let me go ahead and do that. I can type there. There we go. All right. Um, and so question was here. Let's uh, go ahead and where was that question? I saw it over here somewhere. There we go. Somebody was asking, do we have any plans to release a motherboard? Yes, we were actually the first manufacturer to release a motherboard specifically for uh, the Threadripper, Ro Threadripper Pro based platform. And so that actually board right there is our Pro WS. So this is uh, one of the other series that sometimes people forget we have, but it's actually one of the oldest series. It's actually older than ROG, if you can believe that. Um, so uh, we have our Prime series, we have our Pro Art series, we have Tough Gaming, we have ROG Strix, and we have ROG, but we also have WS, which stands for Workstation. And so here we have our Pro WS WRX 80E Sage, and the Sage is going to be a board that is specifically for these Threadripper based pro, uh, Threadripper Pro based platform. So if you're somebody that is really interested in ultra high core count, ultra high memory density, and of course expansive PCIe lane connectivity with of course up, up to 128 PCIe lanes uh, in terms of the motherboard, then this is the board that you're going to want to check out. And it does have already full UEFI support for the latest generation Ryzen Threadripper Pro 5000 series, which of course is based off of the newer Zen 3 microarchitecture. All right. Um, hey, Sudukar. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Happy to have you here on the stream. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and see if we got any other questions here. No, doesn't look like it. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and keep moving things along and we will keep moving it. All right. So uh, next up, um, I do actually want to touch on something that is a little bit kind of interesting and sometimes people forget about uh, when it comes to actually driver updates. So, of course, I'm sure probably a lot of you are aware that uh, there was, of course, a recent driver updates that got released by both AMD and NVIDIA. These are generally going to be the adrenaline driver updates. And then, of course, there's going to be the GeForce game ready based updates. And a lot of times these are uh, released in alignment for new games, right, to be able to ensure the best kind of performance and experience. Um, how many of you guys are going to be playing the brand new Spider-Man remastered? It looks absolutely awesome. Um, I I think it looks really cool but one of the actually really cool things that's also included within the nvidia driver update is that we do continually work with nvidia to actually see if we can have our uh, certain monitors be added into the formal geforce uh, 
uh, compatible uh, G-Sync application. Um, and so essentially what happens is when the driver installs and detects that monitor's present uh, through the AID information, it can essentially help to maximize and ensure a good experience when it comes to enabling um, the adaptive sync or essentially G-Sync. So there's actually a lot of extra steps that have to go through to be formalized as a G-Sync compatible display. Um, this also includes elements within the driver. And so there will be actually some monitors that originally um, might not actually list G-Sync compatibility on, let's say, the product page, but then through a driver update at a later stage, we can actually update them to support G-Sync. So I do want to talk about, uh, we do have actually two new additions specifically uh, for that. So let me go ahead and bring these up because I think these are two really uh, solid monitors right here that we're adding in. So the, uh, we have one right here with this will be the XG uh, 276Q. So this is going to be a 27 inch. So larger than standard kind of like 24, 25 inch, still 1080p. So very easy to drive in terms of the resolution. IPS based display supporting up to 170 hertz um, display HDR 400 specification while not uh, necessarily going to be really an HDR based monitor, it's still going to give you a much brighter based monitor than you would traditionally have, especially if you're coming up for most users, which are generally averaging usually about a 200 nit monitor. So it's going to be quite a bit brighter. Um, one other really cool thing that this display will offer is that it does have a really cool feature that we've started to put in more of our displays, which is this integrated tripod mount. So there's actually a threaded mount at the top of the monitor, which you could actually attach a secondary monitor to. You could attach actually a mirrorless camera. You can attach a light. You can attach a lot of different things to that threaded mount. So that's pretty cool in terms of its over flexibility. Um, you've got two HDMI ports and display port on this monitor. This does also support our desk mount kit, which means that we actually have a little um, mounting kit that can you can purchase separately. It's about $50, where if you want to change this into a C mount, you can remove that base and that can clamp to the bottom of a monitor, which is pretty cool. And then I'm pretty sure this monitor also supports display widget. So let me quickly just see that. I'm pretty sure this one does support display widget. Um see right here. Yes, it does support display widget. So in case anybody's wondering, like, what is display widget? Um, most of you probably on the stream have seen me talk about this before, but display widget would be an application like this. I don't have my display connected to the system right now, but you can see the cool thing about it is you can adjust things like brightness, contrast, sharpness, um, shadow boost. And the really cool thing I really love is using this app sync feature, which means you can actually set your monitor presets for different applications. So take, for instance, if you open up your web browser, you can set it to like sRGB, when you opened it up a photo application, it could also be under sRGB. But if let's say you opened up like uh, CSGO or Apex Legends, and maybe you want to have shadow boost enabled, or you want to tune kind of the sharpness, or you want to tune the brightness, you could do that. And the great thing is that it'll dynamically adjust based on when the EXE is present in the foreground. So it allows you to really take advantage of more options in your monitor that normally you probably wouldn't adjust because it can be kind of time consuming to always go back and physically touch the monitor in terms of its buttons. So that's one monitor that we've gone ahead and added in uh, with GSYN compatibility. And then the other is going to be this monitor right here, which will be the XG256Q. Um, really great monitor in terms of kind of like uh, price to performance and specifications that you should get here. So you're going to have a fast IPS-based display, the GSYN compatibility. Um, this one's a little bit smaller, so 2560, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, 25 uh, inches as opposed to the 27 inches on the prior one, uh, 180 hertz in terms of the refresh rate, and then pretty much all the other similar items. Again, the tripod socket, display widget, the HDR 400, the layout is a little bit different in terms of the IO here. You see two HDMI display port and then an integrated USB hub. The hub is really nice if you want to attach things maybe like a USB, say, USB headset or maybe like a wireless adapter for a, a mouse or a keyboard or something along those lines. So it gives you some added kind of flexibility. Okay. All right. So that is going to be that. And... Again, I'm pretty sure this one has display widget, but just let me check it for you. And also, I don't think I said the resolution for this, and this one's 1920 by 1080 also. Okay. It should be in there. Yep, display widget also on this monitor. So both of them have that. All right, very cool. So just a quick update that I want to make in that regard, and uh, we will keep moving things along here. So give me a second to go ahead and move those out. Um, JG did the live stream on both of them either last week or week prior. Um, yeah, Pidgey PCs, if you're talking about the uh, AM, AM5 series motherboards, yes, we did get those covered and they're on demand right now where you can go ahead and check them out on our YouTube channel. So you're good to go, okay?
Um, let me see. So Nelson's asking us here, I was watching your Asus PCDIY show 58. You showed the Zen send screen MB. 249 CE. Oh, so that's actually an upcoming, that's a really big uh, portable monitor. It's our biggest portable monitor that we've actually ever made. Uh, can you mount it with a Visa stand and when will it be available? Uh, that one, actually, we don't still have a confirmed kind of timeline for that one. I think probably we'll have maybe an update towards the end of this quarter. Um, so probably... Uh, you know, sometime the middle or late next month is we should have a little bit more information in terms of its overall availability. Um, in terms of visa mount support, um, I don't know. I'll have to actually double check that. If you want, make sure to email me at pcdiy at asus.com and I'll see if I can go ahead and double check on that specification for you to see if it would have visa mount. Generally, of course, with a very thin base display, um, it's kind of complicated in terms of trying to add something like a visa mount, but generally we do have the tripod based support, which would allow you to go ahead and position it um, so you could have it like above a, a monitor or below a, like a laptop or something like that if you want to have that flexibility, okay? Okay. Um, let me just see right there. Is there any other questions that came up right there? And Andreas, happy to have you here, man. Thanks so much for letting us know, man. Hey, oh, fantastic, man. Thanks so much for joining us here also on the stream right here. Johnny Boy's asking, uh, does Armory Crate keep up with the most recent drivers? So we do, so that's actually always a really interesting question, I guess, before I get into the next item. People always ask about that as far as like kind of do that you did you should update your drivers and things along those lines so the thing that you always want to keep in mind is that uh take for instance as a as a board manufacturer right we do our own validation specifically for the driver that we release on our support page right and in some situations the actual drivers have to be specifically kind of tailored to the controller that we might implement on a product an example of this can be like audio packages or networking packages while there sometimes can be open kind of let's say general purpose drivers that might be made available take for instance from intel or it could be made available for real tech, our drivers might actually have a specific software package and may, may be specifically tuned in a way specific to our hardware base um, kind of configurations. And so they actually have to pass through our QVL and our validation process. So when you go through Armory Crate, um, there's actually a tab within Armory Crate. Uh, let me see if I can actually load it up here on this system right here. So I think I should be able to load it up for you guys here. All right. Uh, let's give me a second here. All right. So uh, wasn't planning for this, but hey, that's the point of a stream here, right? So let's go and um, if we load up here, Armory Crate, and I head over here, right, to the tab section, you'll see that you have kind of different tabs and you can go over to tools. So one of the things that we have been working on is actually implementing what we call here is the dynamic updating option for drivers. And so you can see right now, none of the drivers are highlighted because all my drivers have been actively installed. If there was a newer driver that was present, um, you could actually just click it and then download it and install it. So generally, if there is an update that's present, it should be reflected in here. There are still some backend items that we are working on. Um, it also does not include UEFI BIOS updates, but if you actually download the My Asus app, the My Asus app does currently track UEFI BIOS updates. And there's also some other benefits to My Asus app for like service to support related aspects if you did want to have that. So um, in terms of overall drivers, it's fine for covering your drivers for, let's say, your core components, but it's not going to cover drivers for other devices you might have on your system that you'd still need to check from your manufacturer. Okay. And again, you may still find that the manufacturer also has a newer driver that's available, but that driver might not actually be listed on our site because we might have not validated it. Generally, we don't always kind of um, maybe update to the latest driver because again, that takes time and we have to find a specific reason as to why that driver should be kind of essentially revalidated and implemented. Um, sometimes new drivers come out, but they're maybe not specific to us. Maybe they're released for a different version of that controller or maybe specific to another manufacturer. Right. And so that driver doesn't necessarily require an updating on our end. So hopefully that answers that question. Hey, Snuff, happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. All right. OK, so uh, let's go ahead and keep moving things along. Uh, are there any news? Uh, rep uh, any news on the ROG SFX Loki PSU and then will it launch before Ryzen 7 Thunder Series? So I can't talk specifically regarding the embargo when it comes to um, next generation Ryzen series processors and the next gen platform. But what I can tell you in terms of the Loki is that we're probably not going to have a release for that until at earliest the very end of September, kind of early October. Right now we're hoping to maybe hit 
the end of Q3, but I think probably realistically it might not be available until the very beginning of Q4 timeframe. For anybody that's wondering about the Loki, the Loki will be our SFX high wattage based power supply. So we of course already offer very high performance based ATX based power supplies, but for builders that really wanna have a super dense and compact based power supply, then the Loki is going to be the option for you. And the other, I think, really big benefit that we're going to have with the Loki is because they're kind of taking the same focus as our Thor and Strict Series power supplies, where they're very, very quiet. Um, some of the SFX power supplies on the market you can get are very high wattage, but they're not necessarily that quiet. So you get a very high performance based power supply that's small, but oddly enough, you put it into a system that's small, but it's going to be maybe louder than an ATX based power supply. So it's kind of like an interesting situation in terms of. Um, that the SFX power supply isn't optimally suited to the form factor. So I think that's going to be one of the biggest strengths that we're going to have with the uh, Loki series. Okay. All right. Um, so feel free, if you guys got more questions, go ahead and drop them in there, but I want to keep moving things along. So let's get ready to jump into our next item here. All right. So um, I do want to go ahead and just touch on, let's see, I think we got... Um, still, uh, the AMD game bundle that's still going on. So make sure to keep that in mind, guys. Um, AMD right now is working with us in terms of a promotion for the raise, uh, the game offer. So I will go ahead and uh, just bring a quick kind of a link to that. So right now, essentially the way this works is that you can essentially get free games if you have the purchase of an Asus AMD based graphics card. So this would include like our dual series or our ROG strict series or our ROG tough gaming series. Um, you can actually see right here that it's dependent on the GPU that you're making the purchase of, right? So if you're, let's say, buying anything from that 6700 all the way up to a 6900 uh, series graphics card, you actually can get three titles. Um, but even if you go all the way down to something like a 6400 or a 6500 base graphics card, you can get one game title, okay? So that's pretty much already bundled in uh, at the manufacturer. So if you like go Newegg and right now you would get like a uh, Asus Strix or Tough Gaming, um, you know, 6750 XT or something like that, then it would already be applied into that. And then you just have to go through the redemption process. Um, and that is going to be running until September 10th. So just make sure to keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Um, so next up from there, let me go ahead and see um, what next, what next here. Do I have the giveaway promotions? I think, yeah, I think we're going to be good on those guys. So we were not going to worry about that. So uh, I think let's get ready to go ahead and jump into some of the uh, newest products that we're actually going to be showing off here. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look, I guess, at the first one. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a new PA series monitor. This is going to be the new PA348 CGV. And again, anybody has any questions, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'll do my best to go ahead and follow up with them shortly there. Um, so this is going to be a new update that we're going to be offering here in terms of a um, display. The cool thing about this display is, of course, it's going to be an addition to our PA series, which means it's kind of our ProR uh, series here. This is really going to be kind of tailored for, in, I'd say, enthusiasts that really care about color accuracy, right? Um, they're probably doing some type of content creation. So that could be videography. It could be animation. Um, it could be, of course, uh, 3D work, um, you know, anything within a scenario where you kind of really have to be critical in terms of color quality, color accuracy, then that's really going to be a big benefit here. So there are some really cool things that are going to be present on this display. So the first thing, of course, is you're going to get that, of course, ultra wide, which just gives you a really nice expansion a field of view. It's going to be great for things like a non-linear editor. So of course you can have that in your timeline all at the bottom right here at the display. And then of course have still lots of room in terms of the actual primary kind of monitor field up there at the top. Of course, like all ProArt series displays, it comes factory calibrated out of the box for outstanding color accuracy. You can see right there, the accuracy is very, very high. And that's Kalman verified at really a, a flagship industry standard in terms of the um, overall validation. Uh, you've got 98% DCI-P3 coverage, so that's outstanding in terms of that coverage, and 100% right there, uh, sRGB and Rec. 709 in terms of the color gamut. So it's going to be fantastic for real, worse, you, uh, real world you, uh, workflow. Um, so no issues in that regard. Um, this is also going to be an update generally not seen. If you take a look at this, it's going to be one is USB-C. So we were one of the first manufacturers to really start supporting actively USB-C on our monitors. This is great 
great if you want to be able to connect this to things like a laptop or maybe even a tablet or a phone that has that. And you also have 120 hertz, which is rare for kind of professional based displays. Um, the 120 hertz, while it doesn't really kind of add to a value from a creator standpoint, gives you just a fluidity and nice motion experience in desktop applications when you're moving back and forth between windows, moving back and forth between um, you know images that you might be bringing up, different folders. It's just going to feel snappier, more responsive, and overall provide you a better experience. And if you are working in maybe variable refresh rates in terms of your content, it's nice that you actually have a native high refresh rate that is going to be an option, especially because a lot of people will either be shooting at 60 hertz and then uh, drop down uh, when it comes to kind of slow motion, or they might shoot in something like 120 frames a second, right? Um, so here you also, of course, have an IPS-based display. That USB-C is going to support power delivery and display signal, so up to 90 watts. So that means a single cable, of course, can connect that to something like our Studio Book, our Vivo Book, or any number of our different laptops that have that. So you can power the laptop directly, and you can also get the display signal all passed through. So very nice and very convenient in terms of the overall experience. Um, of course, that outstanding color coverage. This also does have outstanding options for calibration. So a lot of people forget, like when you talk about a basic monitor, you may be able to color calibrate it to a good standard, um, but it might not offer you, let's say, like six color access control and independent gamma adjustment, where let's say on a professional display, we do give you six color access and independent gamma. On a traditional monitor, it might only be like a three color access adjustment, right? So that's some of just the differences that you have available to you. Uh, we also, of course, have all these different quick options in terms of toggling between different workflows. So sRGB, Rec. 709, DCI-P3, a reading mode, which is really great for just, you know, email, websites, things along those lines, right? And also even an HDR work workflow. Um, I'm a big fan right here of the desk C clamp that comes with it. So you can see right there, you can go ahead and swap that base and then just mount it directly to uh, your desk. And that makes it really convenient to be able to make adjustments, um, right? Still taking advantage of the ergonomic elements, but cleaning up and giving yourself more space in terms of your desktop setup, right? So USB-C, HDMI, DisplayPort, and the USB-C hub. Now, one of the really cool things on the USB, excuse me, um, the, uh, the hub is going to be the way that we position the ports. So actually, let me show you, go ahead, let me actually show you some images here really quickly. And I'm also gonna confirm that pricing for you because I didn't add it in there. This one is gonna be coming in at 729. So let me go ahead and actually just amend that price right there so that we can see that. So this will be, 29. Okay, and I think I got images for it right here. <clears throat> it should be in this folder, hopefully. <laughs> um, that's uh, the other display. And there we go. Okay, perfect. All right. So yes, so let me go ahead and show you this right here. And so here you can see the display, really nice, clean, kind of refined design, very much matches up with a lot of our other kind of pro R based products. You can see the nice little pass through, nice large, large base. And the other thing on pro art displays is you're going to see right here is front facing buttons, right? So on a lot of other monitors, the buttons are like on the back or there's like a joystick. Um, but when you're kind of working, I think from a professional perspective, and you maybe also want to take advantage of like our different overlay options, it's really nice to be able to have, of course, all the different menus accessible directly from the front of the display. Of course, you have full height adjustment. And here's the big thing that I really like about this type of display is that you'll notice that uh, we give you a lot of connectivity here. So you actually have the USB ports directly right there on the side of the display. And then there's two at the bottom. So if you wanted to connect everything from, let's say, like a high speed card reader to like a wireless adapter for a keyboard and mouse to like a printer, you know, maybe a scanner, um, different types of high speed hard drive, you know, any of those type of things. It's really nice and convenient. I really like the side profile because it's very easy to just leverage it right there from the side. But then you also have the bottom right there. So you've got a lot of flexibility in terms of just the way that it's kind of laid out in that regard. Okay. And in terms, in terms of overall kind of timeline for this display, you should be looking for availability probably around, um, I'd say the very end of this month, you should probably be seeing it pop up. It might show up maybe a little bit earlier, but I would say towards the end of this month, beginning of next month in terms of availability. So uh, before we go over to the next display, let me just quickly see if we have any questions right there. Sneff says, um, um, 
you see right here. Ooh, I like this one a lot. Yeah, I think this is a really solid monitor for the price point. You know, you get a high quality display, a lot of connectivity, the USB-C, color accurate. You know, it's a really nice balance of not being super expensive, but really giving you a great experience. And I also, like I said, I really like that, even that 120 hertz refresh rate. So again, um, really gives you a really great and kind of well-balanced experience. Um, any info on installing a Thunderbolt 4 add-in card? So I'm not, I'm not wondering, excuse me, I'm wondering what you're wondering about for the Thunderbolt 4 add-in card. It's pretty straightforward. We do have support documentation on our website. Um, you do need to make sure that there's three things that are in play. One, there has to be UEFI BIOS support for the Thunderbolt card. Um, two, there has to actually be a Thunderbolt header on the motherboard, and that's listed actually in the technical specifications. Three, you have to make sure to connect the actual cable from the card to the port on the motherboard so that it actually works. And then uh, the last item is actually making sure that you toggle the option within the UEFI BIOS to enable the Thunderbolt add-in card. There is also, sorry, I guess last but not least, would be also making sure to install the Thunderbolt driver. As long as all those items are present, you should be good to go in terms of actually being able to take advantage of the Thunderbolt add-in card. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, Mohako is asking, are these monitors good for competitive gaming? Sorry if it was asked already. Looking forward to a new XX70 boards. So this monitor wouldn't really be suited for gaming. I mean, we make our ROG Strix and ROG Swift, and then of course our tough gaming uh, monitors, really those are going to be for competitive gamers. You're going to have generally what's called uh, the lowest input lag. Um, you're also going to have, you know, generally higher refresh rates. Um, you're also going to have things like um, adaptive sync and backlight strobing support. So for motion clarity enhancement, those are going to be the displays that we would recommend if you have like a specific budget or target that you're interested in let me know and we can definitely try to see if we can get you some recommendations or make sure to ask in the group um we've covered tons of different monitors in this stream but you know we really have you covered from top to bottom whether you want to go all the way at the ultra high refresh rate with something like 360 hertz at 1080p or you want to do you know uh, 240 hertz at 1440p right or you want to do ultra wide we have a monitor in the rg or the tough gaming lineup that will get you covered okay Okay. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and keep moving on to the next one right here. And we will uh, go over to the next product. So let me add in the price for this one because I'm sure people uh, will ask about it right here. So this is going to be truly a flagship display. You guys might have noticed it in the little bit of the intro image when we did talk about it. Uh, excuse me, uh, in the intro to this stream right here, but this is the Pro rpa 32 dc So this is an actually OLED monitor, and this is really interesting for a lot of different reasons. Right now, there's not that many OLED-based displays that are on the market. Um, when it comes to a true monitor, uh, OLED has, of course, been predominantly seen within the HDTV arena, but it hasn't generally been seen, of course, in the desktop um, monitor arena. And uh, here, we actually really have a uh, kind of a screen size that is really tailored towards desktop productivity, right? And again, this being a pro art display, this is not a gaming display, but this is for serious professionals that are really looking for outstanding color accuracy, right? Rich connectivity in terms of the display and really are going to be, I'd say, you know, in the animation field, videography field, professional photography, whether you're talking about like portraiture or landscape, things along those lines, you're really kind of a professional. You're using this display day in and day out because this is part of your job, part of your professional workflow. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this beautiful display. Um, it has really got an amazing set of specifications and its overall design I think is quite nice in terms of its overall design aesthetic as well. So I think actually I have a little bit of a video right here, so we can actually take a look here at a video too. So let me go ahead and bring that up and we'll check that out first. Okay. So this is right here, this is the PA32DC. So this is gonna be a 4K based display. Um, the big thing that you'll see right here actually within this video, what it's showing you is actually this is going to be using a pure OLED base panel, not a W OLED base panel. And I'll talk a little bit about what is the difference there because traditionally most of the actual OLED panels on the market and even many of the ones that we've used in our other OLED enabled products have actually been a W OLED, which means that there's actually a white uh, sub pixel that's present there, but that actually influences certain aspects in terms of color rendering performance. Um, so there is going to be a difference here. And this actually allows us to achieve even a higher degree of color accuracy. You also see right here, a very cool thing is that 
we've given a lot of flexibility and thought to how actually the monitor may be used from feedback that we've had from professionals, where it can be used in a traditional kind of desktop based configuration, and then in a more ergonomic, uh, traditional kind of monitor based configuration and with also the actual IO existing on both the left hand side and the right hand side for qu quick and easy kind of connections. So really, really cool in that regard. So uh, let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper. And we're going to take a look at the display. And we're going to talk about some of the aspects that kind of make this, I, I think, very unique and interesting uh, display in terms of its overall uh, feature set. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and just bring up some of the images right here. So first up, uh, you'll see this is going to be 31.5 inches, okay, and it will actually come included with both of these uh, configurations in terms of how the monitor can be set up essentially. So one, you kind of have like a desktop, um, I'd say portable based configuration, although this is large for professionals, if they're actually going on site and doing actually production workflow, doing photography and videography, this gives you a reference grade kind of image quality experience that you can go ahead and set up. That's also the reason why you have the actual monitor hood to help to go ahead and manage reflections. Now, you might be wondering, what is a, a polarizer or kind of the uh, the layer that's in the front of the actual panel. And so here we're actually using what might be referred to as kind of like a semi-gloss. Um, and this is a very, very kind of optimized polarizer to be able to maximize image clarity, uh, brightness performance, and good off-axis viewing. It's not going to be, though, uh, like what you would have like on the HDTV, which is going to be super glossy, but also very, very sensitive to reflections. Um, but to be able to, like I said, mitigate that, that's the reason why it comes with the monitor hood. Another thing that you'll see is, of course, that maintaining of those front facing buttons for e easy access. Of course, you have the cable routing uh, mounted right there for the base. And this does have full ergonomic adjustment. So you can go with, you know, uh, tilt, pivot, height, and even swivel adjustments. Here at the top, this is kind of an interesting thing. You might be wondering, well, like, what's going on with that? Well, uh, there is some cool stuff that we have going on there. So uh, one of the things that you'll actually see here is, is that with a professional display, you do want to be able to maintain color accuracy over time. A lot of people sometimes forget about this, or maybe they don't have a colorimeter, or they forget to use the colorimeter. The great thing about this is we've integrated the colorimeter built into the monitor. So you can actually even set it up on an automated basis that it will go maybe every three weeks, every five weeks, every you know quarter, every three months, and it would automatically check the monitor for color accuracy and allow you to go ahead and ensure you're getting the best color performance. And the reason being is that actually color performance will change what we'll call what's drift. So essentially it will get worse over time. So you do need to go back and recalibrate your display for the best experience consistently. Um, there also can be variations in things like lighting. You might not realize that the actual color rendering performance can change between you having your lighting on and then your lighting kind of off. And so there are also gonna be elements to where you wanna have to actually kind of optimize configurations. You could also have different kind of aspects depending on what you wanna profile for different workflows. Um, there's a lot of factors that kind of play into this. One of the other cool things too is that we've built in the ability to actually have our uh, profiles automatically saved to the inside of the monitor. So normally when you switch devices, you might actually have to go through entirely a calibration process, but now you don't have to do that. We can store all the information directly within the monitor to allow you to maintain a much more consistent workflow. This is really advantageous for people that work with like a desktop and a laptop configuration. Okay. And of course, uh, a big thing right here is that million to one contrast ratio. That's really the big benefit of OLED, right? Compared to even the best, you know, IPS based displays, VA based displays, other panel technology. The only thing that can really kind of rival this is something that hasn't really been introduced yet, which would be micro LED technology. Um, and this essentially just means is that these pixels can individually kind of turn off and on. And this allows you to essentially have true black performance and really, really impressive color gradation, as well as uniformity across uh, the panel. So uh, uniformity would mean the consistency of the light output across the entirety of the display. OK, uh, there you can see that motorized colorimeter. And we include uh, the, the software to remind you and kind of set that all up. That's inside of our ProArt display widget software. So very, very easy to access and kind of configure. Here you can kind of see a nice setup configuration of what that could look like in maybe a professional type environment, right? And this is the other cool thing that I was talking about in terms of if you take a look here at the display configuration, um, how we have it set up. So you'll see 
All the ports right here are easy to access on the side. So you've got three HDMI and then DisplayPort. DisplayPort would be the preferred connection to maximize in terms of full 10-bit and high-resolution 4K performance. So do keep that in mind. You have 65 watts that is supported with the USB-C. So you can also power, let's say, something like a laptop. If you're even an Apple user or a PC user, that's a great benefit. Um, so again, you can connect your display and also power your laptop past that through. And then you also have, of course, these high-speed Gen 2 Type-A ports. So again, if you want to connect things like flash drives, an external hard drive, a printer, a mirrorless camera, different types of devices, they can all be easily connected right there on the side of the display. And then, of course, right there, you still see you have Visa mount support. So if you want to put this on something like a monitor arm, you can definitely still do that. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, show you actually a little bit of the difference in terms of the display uh, technology, right, in terms of the panel that I was noting here. So let me see if I can bring up that information. So give me one second. And uh, I will jump into the comments there in a second to see if we have any questions. Um, I know this is a little bit outside of the norm of some of the content that we tend to talk about where a lot of the stuff we focus on is in gaming, but we try to cover really kind of the breadth and depth of a lot of our different products uh, here on the PC DIY hardware stream. So whether you're a gamer or you're kind of a professional, we try to make sure that we cover kind of a little bit of everything, right? Okay, so I think I have it over here. Ah, uh, this is something that I do want to touch on. So if anybody's kind of interested in HDR, while this is not um, kind of a ultra high bright monitor, let's say like our PA32 UG UGC, which is a mini LED full array backlight, which can go up to like 1400 nits in terms of brightness. This is still a very capable monitor and giving you actually an HDR experience. Um, can support around, uh, around 500 nits in terms of the brightness, uh, but because of its actually really nice self-emissive technology, it allows for really nice gradation in terms of highlight Lights. And we also do implement what are called our tone mapping options right here. And these are essentially different uh, presets that allow the actual content to be mapped to how the display can manage the readout of that information and the display of that information. So you can see here, you can go and you can toggle different options to see how it best kind of complements your workflow and the content that you're essentially attempting to work with. So you have what's called a PQ clip, PQ optimizer, or PQ basic. And this essentially is just mapping the content in relation to how the display can best output that, right? Uh, the reason being is you might have content that might be mastered to, let's say, up to like a thousand nits or 2000 nits, right? But if the monitor is only 500 nits, how does it work within that? Well, you can actually have the monitor make certain choices in terms of how it maps the range of that. And so one is going to be clipping it, a limit, right? And the one's going to be an optimized where it tries to map it within the range that the monitor can support. So that's where, again, you'll see a difference. And there's not like a wrong way or wrong, a right way to do this. It just comes down to kind of the content in your workflow. Um, Go ahead and show you one other thing right here. Let me see if we have it right here. Ah, yeah. This is also another cool element with a larger display like this, uh, with especially, I think, 32 inches. A cool uh, item that you do have available to you is going to be the picture in picture and picture by picture functionality. So you can actually see right here that you do have different options that, depending on the display input, you can map different sources to be like side by side. So you can imagine having like your editor, but then maybe if you wanted to output from, let's say, a laptop or like a mirrorless camera or something like that, you could actually have this configured to where you could see side by side, or then you could have actually a three image uh, uh, breakout, or you could have even a four image breakout. So you have a lot of flexibility in terms of giving you multiple input sources that could all be previewed there. And you can also then see the picture in picture is pretty cool, where then you could map that either into the top right, uh, top left, or the bottom right, or to the bottom left. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to kind of map and lay out other input sources to take advantage of all those inputs that you have on the display, depending on how your workflow scenario. And um, there is, do I have it over here? Oh, sorry, I thought I still had it here. So I want to see if I can show it to you. And uh, I guess I don't have it in here. Okay. Yeah, I thought I had a slide uh, that I had saved here that actually talked about uh, the difference in terms of the 
OLED. But as I noted, right, with W OLED versus traditional OLED, um, the main difference is going to be is this is a pure OLED, so it's going to be just RGB with no white subpixel. And the big benefit you have with that is going to be is essentially the brighter the monitor gets when you have that white subpixel in there, it can actually affect the overall rendering performance uh, for the colors. And so essentially not having that present allows us to maintain overall better color accuracy, which is part of the reason why the monitor is so color accurate out of the box with essentially that Delta E below one, right? Which is really, really high grade. The industry goal is already kind of two. And technically, perceptually, I think if you can hit below about 2.5, perceptually you shouldn't almost even see it. Um, so the fact that we're that tight really helps to ensure just an outstanding experience uh, when it comes to the overall display. Um, so, you know, we of course, we offer a wide range of options. We offer everything from mini LED, to VA, to IPS, to now OLED. We have portable OLED, we have this type of OLED. So we are support really kind of all types of panel technologies, but this is just another option that we're bringing in here. So let me go ahead and just see if we have any questions right here before we get ready to go into our next product. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and jump into that. So let me just see right here. So um, Blackheart saying, People said that there was burn-in with COT monitors, but I never had that issue. So I'm assuming probably somebody's asking actually about burn-in um, on an OLED. So um, Dual Master's going, does this have a fan inside? No, this is an entirely passive-based solution. This is actually a really good point and something that I did not talk about. So on OLED-based displays, one thing that you do want to keep in mind is that there is generally going to be something called an ABL or an average brightness limiter. Um, and this is designed to try to manage overall the peak brightness because um, the kind of the, the enemy of an OLED based technology is going to be heat, uh, which can be produced by running the actual um, OLED substructure essentially to a higher degree, to essentially a brighter degree. And so on TVs, you'll actually find that what they do is that when they actually get too bright, especially like in a desktop monitor scenario. So if you're going from like a really bright environment, like your browser, you open something up and then you go to like a darker environment, you'll see like this really weird shift. We actually have options that we've enabled to give you flexibility to manage this type of experience. And so in this scenario, um, I think we do have this up on our product page, but it's actually called a uniform brightness setting. And so we can actually allow you to toggle in this uniform brightness setting. So you'll actually see that right here. Um, when you toggle the uniform brightness setting, you can see right here with and without it. So when you actually do not have this enabled, you'll notice this variable kind of brightness setting, which can be a little bit kind of annoying when you talk about using this, the monitor in a general kind of productivity perspective. Um, and you can go ahead and then toggle that and that will actually reduce the peak brightness of the display, but you'll have a far more consistent experience for wherever you're kind of going in and out of different type of Windows environments. So that is an option that we have gone ahead and integrated within there. Okay. Somebody's asking about the ROG uh, PG32UQXC in terms of price and availability. Price, I can't tell you. Um, we haven't finalized the MSRP yet. Availability probably going to be um, late Q3, maybe early Q4. It probably should be released around the same time frame as we also have the update for the PG32UQ, which would be the PG32UQR. So the PG32UQXC will be a very cool because it's incorporating a new type of uh, mini LED technology uh, from a, a co kind of a panel manufacturer that we've been working with. That'll be a very interesting product that we'll have that I think will be a bit more aggressively priced, of course, than what we offered with the pg 3 t um, UQX, right, which is now EOL. That was our kind of our flagship ultrawide monitor, very similar to the PG3G-UCG, uh, right? Uh, but we have the uh, UQXE. So that one will be, like I said, hopefully coming out maybe about Q3 timeframe, late Q3 timeframe. Um, does uh, ASUS offer an extended warranty? No, we do not offer an extended warranty. I believe that we have finalized the warranty for these monitors. Uh, this should be a, it's a little bit different. Normally on many of our monitors, we have a what's called limited three year uh, warranty with advanced rapid replacement. Uh, I believe on the OLED based displays, it's a two year uh, based warranty. So there is a revision to the warranty policy in that regard. 
Paul is saying something about still blooming with mini LED. So yeah, uh, when you talk about kind of um, the benefit of OLED compared to even mini LED, mini LED can definitely offer uh, extremely brighter based picture. But uh, when you talk about, I think, radiation and blooming, OLED is going to be really the best. It's going to be the highest standard. There is some next generation uh, true black IPS based technology, which will be offering about twice the contrast of current IPS, which would definitely be improved in that regard, but still really the gold standard in terms of I think blooming performance is going to be from OLED and from micro LED technology, but we don't yet have any micro LED based monitors on the market as of yet. Um, Video Man is asking, is there any way to change the display or the intensity of the motherboard? I'm not sure what you're asking about, Video Man. If you can go ahead and give me a little bit more information behind that, that would be great. And you could let me know. Um, someone's asking about, I sure hope the 42 inch gaming OLED is nowhere near. So I can't give you the exact pricing. I can tell you the pricing will be different though, because it's a, it's a different, it's an entirely different panel. Um, it's based off of an uh, w oled panel um, the specifications are different it also while it's factory calibrated which is much better than say something like an lg uh, c series based uh, tv which is not a monitor um, and there are going to be some enhancements that we have in terms of display connectivity and other elements we'll have actually a full dedicated stream specifically on the rog swift um, 42 inch and 48 inch monitors when we release those probably in September. So make sure to keep it tuned for September for those monitors where we'll be diving into all their features, functions, design, specifications, and everything about that. Okay. Asual computers, I believe I answered the warranty uh, question there. Specifically for the OLED, all of our standard Pro Art series displays would be all three years with advanced rapid replacement. Um, but for the specifically OLED variant, as revised to two years. Okay. All right. Um, I think that probably covers that. So let me just go ahead and see. Ruffins go, do you recommend it for console gaming? Um, I'm assuming if you're just probably wondering about a monitor for console, let me go ahead and give you my recommendation here and I will tell you about this and then we will get to our next new product. But I, have, I think if this is your question, hopefully it was, if it's not, I'm sorry. Um, this would be my recommendation for our kind of console-centered monitor, if especially if you want 4K. Although, you know, 4K is kind of debatable in terms of the real value because the reality is both for Xbox and PlayStation, they don't really render most games at 4K. Games. They usually do some type of adaptive resolution or kind of like checkerboarding. So a lot of times it's like really closer to like 1440p. Um, but here we have the VG28UQL1A. This is a fast IPS-based display. It supports HDMI 2.1. It's a bright monitor. Um, it's one of my favorite options that we have within our lineup if you're looking for a great HDR, excuse me, for a great... Um, monitor that aligns with the current specifications in terms of variable refresh rate support for like PlayStation 5 and for Xbox, right? And giving you that support to still even go to 4K, a brighter than standard base display with up to that 400 uh, nits, right? And then also giving you really great color coverage. We offer a couple of other options too that would be, I think, really good recommendations if this is a little bit more than you want to spend. Um, if you're looking for some other recommendations, let me know and you can definitely tag me in the group, okay? All right, so let's get ready to go into our next product here. And we'll keep moving things along. So next one is going to be the ROG Strix graphics card holder. So a lot of you are already aware that we have, of course, already launched a few of our graphics card holders. Um, this one right here is, of course, already available. This is the ROG Herculix, right? I really like this one, right? Of course, you can do all the really cool stuff where you can adjust it. It has a cool little spirit level that comes with it. Uh, it's got that really cool addressable light bar, right? Um, and then we also have the wing wall. The wing wall is a... Uh, even more premium, you know, as far as the metal construction body, it's got a thicker acrylic uh, plating to it. And of course you can customize it. This one though, is going to be kind of like, I would say our cost value um, kind of focus model. I don't like to really use the word value because people will use that from a perspective that always means low cost. And I don't think that's accurate. I think you could spend a lot of money and have a lot of value, right? Um, but definitely this will be our lowest cost option with the ROG Strix graphics card holder, or actually, no, I think actually the Herculix might be around the same price. Um, so now that I actually think about it, it won't be the lowest price to option. Um, so let me go ahead and bring this one up and we'll show you what we got right here. So see here, do I have the images for it? Should have the images for it. And I will put the pricing there in a moment right there. 
All right, here we go. Yep, I got it right here. Yep. All right, so this is going to be the ROG Strix graphics card holder. Uh, I'd say the big difference here compared to like the Hercules and the wing wall, I'll see if I can bring up the wing wall in a second here to do a side by side, but this is going to be the kind of the thinnest graphics card holder that we have available. So if you have more limited space in terms of kind of your, um, your uh, chassis in terms of how you're going to be positioning this, this would be the best option because essentially it's going to be kind of the, it's the slimmest in terms of its overall design uh, footprint, right? Um, and then it's going to be pretty much similar to the wing wall right here where you, of course, have this horizontal uh, adjustment, right? And then you, of course, have that little bit of that vertical adjustment. And it does have a pad. I will say that this is something that people can overlook. There are some other kind of graphics cards holders where it's just bare plastic at the top as opposed to having a pad. So that can actually kind of sometimes scuff up the graphics card. So we have even tried to kind of pay attention to that in terms of kind of keeping that in mind. All right. So, of course, you just go ahead and... Uh, Make that adjustment there with the knob to be able to go ahead and increase it vertically to be able to make sure that you have that offset balance in place to be able to go ahead and eliminate the sag and have that uh, evenly lined up and you're essentially good to go. And then that's a full kind of nice metal body right there to give you that nice, clean, stable, of course, um, experience that you want in terms of reducing that sag. Looks really clean. And of course, this is going to have RGB lighting support. So just plug it into a three pin header on your Asus motherboard or any motherboard, but hopefully an Asus motherboard and you'll be good to go. You have that nice dynamic addressable lighting pattern all on display. So uh, let me double check the price one on this one. This one, I think it's going to be 55, I believe. Is that right? Let me double check here. Graphics card holder should be over here somewhere. Yes, $55 will be for the ROG Strix graphics card holder. And let me go ahead and I guess put it side by side. So actually it will be a more expensive than the Herculex because the Herculex is cheaper. The Herculex, this one right here is actually gonna be cheaper than the actual ROG graphic. And that's pretty rare because most of the time, anything that's ROG non-Strix is more expensive. But I think partly that is because this um, is not, this has only a little bit of the metal uh, body construction, while that is going to have more metal. So the more metal, of course, just adds to the cost in terms of production right now. But you may see, uh, of course, some additional, I would say, um, uh, like maybe promotional pricing that will kind of come into play. So just kind of keep that in mind. So let me go ahead and just show you uh, the wing wall and then the the Strix graphics card holder side by side here so you guys can kind of see it here. There we go. Okay, perfect. We'll put this one here and then we'll put this one there. All right, so I don't have two PNGs, so it'll look a little bit off right there. Um, but there you guys can see here's the wing wall. And here's the ROG Strix. Let me just see right here if we have any questions right there. Uh, I like both of them. Sorry if I missed, but any GPU holder and white. So I will cover that in a second, Sniff. And I got sad news for there, but hopefully we'll have that change in a little bit. Yeah, Johnny, I would agree. Um, I have pushed our team on actually that addition uh, for the actual hero boards that came with that nice, just little clean, compact graphics card holder. It's a nice little addition that comes in there, right? Okay. Um, so right here, you'll see that the wing wall, the wing wall is going to be essentially bigger. It's literally thicker. It's a thicker display with a thicker acrylic, right? Um, so this is going to be a more beefy type of, uh, um, actually graphics card support, right? Where here you can see the ROG Strix is going to be more compact and slim. The ID design is also different. The other factor here too, is going to be that the ROG wing wall, this is customizable. So it actually comes with inserts in, on the inside that allow you to change the actual quote unquote display. It's still fully addressable, but you can change actually what's on there. So if you want to personalize that or go with a different look and feel, you can do that on the wing wall while on the ROG Strix one, it's essentially fixed. So um, let me see here if I have the images uh, for the wing wall where I can show you kind of how uh, you can change that up there. Yeah. I think I have them over here. Yes. So let me show you right here. And I will also cover Sniff's question on the white. So this one, guys, I'm showing is not the Strix holder. This is the wing wall, right? Um, but I just want to kind of show you the difference, right? And this one is one that's a little bit more expensive, but you can kind of see the design difference. 
He has that really cool kind of little pattern finish where it's all actually all made up of the ROG lettering, which I think is really cool. And right here, this is, you can see actually where with the customizable acrylic inserts, you can change that up. So if you want to go with different designs, you just pick what you want to go with and you can swap that out. So that's part of the expense of the wing wall is that you have the ability to tailor that and you have the ability to customize that. Okay. And I think we have this one right here. So this is, of course, a custom prototype that we did of white. So right now it is TBD on whether or not we will release the white addition to the wing wall. So right now I'm going to put up a poll in the community. And if you were checking out in the stream, tell me if you want the white edition, because right now we're not going to produce the white edition. Um, so if you really want to see a white on, on the wing wall, you're going to have to let us know. And, and I'm going to help to try to push us so that we can uh, get it out. But right now, we do not plan to release the white edition of the ring wall. So if you guys want it, you guys are going to have to let us know. And we'll do our best to go ahead and see if we can relay that to our product management team and see about getting it produced. OK, so just keep that in mind. OK, so right now we do have the three models available. Well. The third one will be available shortly. We have the RG Herculix. We have the wing wall. And let me know if you do want to see the white edition. Okay. All right. So that is going to be the RG graphics card holder. Uh, let me go back there and just see if we have any comments uh, that came up there. So give me one second. Uh, so let's see. Snuff says, I'm a huge white fan. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. I know that uh, Suman also saying he wants the white. Uh, Kenneth also says he wants the white. Miguel wants the white. Nelson wants the white. HO Computer says, I want the white. And even Johnny Boy says, I don't use it. But I know that people want the white. Yeah, OK. I, I understand. I know. I'm, I'm going to be definitely working with, our, uh, working with our team. And I've already relayed them feedback. So uh, we're going to work on it. Hopefully, I make no promises, but hopefully maybe in uh, Q4, maybe we can see about having that option. Um, so make sure to just keep it tuned. Of course, if we do make it happen, you'll find out definitely here on the stream. And you'll find out um, in terms of the PCDIY group, right? So make sure to just keep it tuned, all right? All right. So, um, yeah, I would agree. Um, a show computer says, yeah, you should do custom inserts. I've talked about that with our team, especially for the wing wall where we've actually talked about maybe because, um, it does have that small little RG insert, but it would be cool if the kind of the wing wall didn't even have that insert. And then from there, if we sold like, um, essentially kind of, um, accent packs, right? So like if you had tough gaming, although we are maybe going to come out with the tough gaming, uh, support, um, that you could essentially kind of have that be tough gaming if you wanted to, right? So you could kind of change it up to kind of go with a different series. So it is something that we've kind of discussed. And it looks like we got one more, right? We got PGPC is also saying that, that he wants it in white, right? Yeah, so um, Suman saying, how about a riser cable? Yes, I don't know if it'll be out before Q4, but we do have one design and development um, for PCI Gen 4, okay. Hey, Nelson's asking, is it hard for you? Um, you know, with the pandemic and the lockdown, I have definitely not been out that often. But I can tell you, you know, when I used to actually go to um, a different e-tailer stores uh, that I would go to. So I was like, sometimes I go to like Fry's or I'd go to like Micro Center or like Best Buy, stuff like that. I would actually sometimes get people that would, you know, kind of like they would do that double look. And every once in a while, sometimes I'd have people that'd be like, hey, are you, you JJ? So yes, it has happened to me, uh, but it's really cool. You know, I mean, I guess it's just indirect from just having so many different videos and stuff that we've done over the years, but it's always cool to be able to kind of meet and greet with um, so many of the amazing community. Um, so it's it's always, it's, it's always cool, you know? All right. All right. So let's get ready to go ahead and keep moving things along here and we will get moving. So that is going to be the ROG Strix graphics card holder. All right. Um, let me see right here. I did want to give one update right here, guys. Uh, this unit is now actually available for pre-order. This is the uh, Zen Screen OLED MQ16AH. So this is a very cool product. Uh, this is actually going to be, um, I showed this, I think, to you guys a little bit before, but let me go ahead and just show it to you one more time right over here. Uh, this is actually a portable OLED display. So if you've actually maybe got, you know, a, a laptop and you really want to be able to have a secondary display, or maybe you want to actually be able to, you know, game on, let's say, uh, you know, a console on the road, or maybe you want to have a bigger screen for your Nintendo Switch, or maybe even you just want a side display 
for your desktop system. And you can, of course, orient this in a landscape or portrait orientation. This is a really cool way to be able to add a really nice, high quality um, uh, OLED based display to your system for not that expensive for $400. So right now, the pre order has gone active. It's live on Amazon. So if you want to pre order it, you can pick it up. So this is 15.6 inches, 1080p resolution, 100% DCPI3. Factory calibrated for outstanding color accuracy outside of the box. Very thin and compact, five millimeters, 620 grams, so very lightweight. It comes included with that really cool stand, which already allows you to go ahead and prop up the display. It does um, actually have a threaded mount right there, so you can have a tripod to be able to go ahead and adjust it if you want to be able to do that. It does not come with that tripod, though, uh, so just keep that in mind. But it does come with that smart case, where you can see the smart case allows you to prop it up, you know, in that kind of, let's say, uh, portrait uh, orientation or vertical orientation for let's say like uh, reading things like discord or maybe like reddit or like email taking a look at kind of comments secondary things like that or just using it as a secondary display in the more traditional uh orientation right proximity sensor i know some people are talking about oled burn in this is a nice feature here too that when essentially it doesn't note that you're there in front of it it'll automatically dim so that helps actually conserve the lifespan of the low lead and reduce the likelihood of any type of burn-in so that's a built-in feature you don't have to do anything about it so that's really cool in terms of that and i really like that we updated the way that we have here the display output configurations um, excuse me well the display put in configurations where you have both usb type c with power and display on both sides so on the right and on the left hand side so it makes it really convenient for being able to go ahead and feed in again you could use this for your mirrorless camera if you just want something bigger right you're shooting photography you're shooting video and you want to be able to see something really clean really bright with outstanding picture quality just plug that in. That's really great experience right there. Use it for your Nintendo Switch, use it for a console, use it for a system, whatever it might be. You have mini HDMI, which means again, between the display port option with the USB type C or the mini HDMI, you can pretty much cover just about any device. And uh, the USB C, of course, is the most flexible because it gives you the ability to have power and display at the same time. While, of course, if you use HDMI, you have to plug in HDMI and a power source, right? You get all the cables inside the box, though, USB-C cable, HDMI cable, and the power, and, of course, that smart case. So it's all inside there. And this is really cool here, this little support foam and the box. Don't throw that away. On the inside of the box, it actually comes uh, with, like, a little monitor hood, if that makes sense. Uh, let me see. I think I have an image of that here. Yeah. So you actually have this cool little kind of box that we've included. So the packaging box, you could set up to be, like, a little special setup to have your own monitor hood to like reduce things like reflections and if you wanted to be kind of sensitive to that you could go ahead and use that and there's even the support frame where you can see you could kind of have a little propped up so that's actually kind of a useful way it's part of a kind of a sustainability focus where you get more value from the box instead of just throwing it away you can kind of use it in a secondary fashion so again this is right now active on pre-order you can pick it up um, and i think it'll be shipping by the end of the month um, if you do go ahead and do the pre-order all right all right, um, let's go ahead and go for that. Uh, Nelson says, P.S., I would ask for your autograph. <laughs> hey, if, it, if, if you would want it, you got it. Let me know. All right, no problem. Yeah, Evo, I think it was asking, or somebody was asking to clarify what I meant by the proximity for the burn-in. Um, essentially, the proximity sensor, right? So that the display, when the display's not on, because of the way that OLED works, it's essentially an emissive-based technology. If those pixels, essentially, it's turned off, right, with the proximity sensor, that means you're reducing the likelihood of getting any type of burn-in, right? The longer that you keep the display on and emissive, there's essentially displaying something, then the higher the likelihood that you essentially have burn-in that's occurring, especially if you have like fixed things that are going to be present on the display, right? So this gives you a benefit by having that built in, right? That you're reducing the likelihood for burning, right? All right. Okay. So that gets us covered there. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, if anybody has any other questions or comments, feel free to go ahead and drop them in. If not, uh, we'll get ready to probably jump right in here into our PC DIY Builders Spotlight in a second. I have one product that I don't have formally noted here because we'll be talking about it in a little bit when it gets ready to launch. But we did go ahead and do a soft announcements for this at CES. And now I want to go ahead and just give a little bit of an update that's going to be getting ready to come out in the not too distant future. But we do have this guy coming out here, the ROG Rapture GTAX 11000 Pro. So this is going to be a tri-band uh, based router, 2.5 gigabit, 10 gigabit, 
two gigahertz quad core based processor uh, that's going to be on here. And also we'll be supporting our WireGuard, um, excuse me, WRT firmware update. So if you don't know about WireGuard, it's a really, really new kind of protocol, which has been designed for optimized VPN type experience. And the really cool thing is that we, when we talk about from a performance perspective, um, the performance can literally be a factor of like two to like four X. So uh, let me go ahead and see. I think I've got my notes here from when I did the testing. And let me see right here. What was the performance delta? Uh, it's going to be pretty sizable. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so. Uh, da -da -da. And... Yeah, so here is a reference uh, via Open OpenVPN, right? Um, and here, I'll, I'll show you guys. This is in my little doc right here that I've got, right? But in the OpenVPN, you can see right here, and this is already quite good with a quad-core based processor compared to many configurations, but you had 154 megabits on the download and on the upload, right? But by just changing to the WireGuard client, right, we can see that it went all the way up to 400 megabits, right? So you're not talking about a 4X performance, but you're talking about over a 3X uh, performance uplift in terms of the overall experience. So if you're somebody that is running VPN directly on your router, the benefit of course being that then all the devices that are gonna be connecting to it benefit from that VPN, um, you're gonna get a significantly better performance. And really kind of one of the key benefits that you're going to have it, when you step over to these higher performing routers is going to be that essentially you have much more wireless bandwidth available to you. But if your VPN is really limiting you at taking advantage of that performance, you can see how it's kind of like you're getting an upgrade, but you're limiting the upgrade, right? And so here, this is a really cool benefit uh, that we're introducing. As far as I'm aware of, we're the only manufacturer of all kind of leading consumer routers that is now actively integrated formal uh, wire guard support inside of the WRT firmware. And we're hoping that probably by the beginning of next year, we'll have it rolled out, I think, to over more than 20 models. So it'll be coming more to more and more models slowly through additional updates that we'll release for the uh, WRT firmware for the supporting routers. But overall, really, really performance-based unit. If you're looking for an outstanding level of speed and coverage, this is going to be a unit for you. The other really big thing is that this unit is going to be integrating support right here. This is a big one, is Uni4 Spectrum. This means that you get additional, essentially, uh, channels um, that are going to be available to you. So these were essentially part of the essentially uh, expanded channels that the FCC allowed for uh, that could be utilized for Wi-Fi where previously we were locked out. And so this essentially is going to be beneficial, especially if you maybe do like an AI mesh configuration and you have two of these units talking to each other through wireless, um, essentially one of these wireless channels, you can get improved performance. So that actually will mean that your then primary wireless signal will be bigger. So you can get faster speed. Um, you can also just benefit in general from your other Wi-Fi 6 devices, right? Um, then having essentially more available bandwidth. The big thing that you always want to keep in mind with wireless speeds, right, that a lot of people forget is with Ethernet, of course, it's the gold standard. It's the fastest option because it's stable and consistent, right? It doesn't matter whether at 10 feet, 100 feet, um, you're going to have effectively the same speed, right? With a 10-foot cable, 50-foot cable, 100-foot cable, it's the same speed. With Wi-Fi, that's not the case. You could have a wireless signal that's, let's say, 1.5 gigabits, so 1,500 megabits of speed. That's awesome, really, really fast. But maybe that only happens within the first 10 feet of the router. When you get to then the next 25 feet, maybe that drops down to about a gigabit. And then when you get to, you know, 150 feet, maybe it drops down to 500 megabits. So that's the goal of when you get a higher performance router that gives you better range, but also higher speeds. It's about trying to make sure that the speed that you get at the furthest point away from your router is ideally at least as fast as the experience that you want to have and hopefully matches the speed of your ISP provider, right? Um, because then that way you can make sure to always leverage the most that your ISP can give you even at the farthest point away uh, in, in, you know, in your wireless environment, right? All right. Uh, so that unit will be coming out in the not too distant future. We'll talk more about that unit when we, when we get ready to launch it, but let's from here, uh, get ready to go into the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. I'm going to go ahead and quickly check, see if we've got any questions that might've popped up here while I get ready to go ahead and uh, check out my images. So give me one second to get these images up in here for our PC DIY Builder Spotlight. And uh, one second right here. Let me, let me block some of these users right here and some of the spam that we got going on. All right, uh, very, very cool. Um, 
See me right here. I got a question. Hey, JJ, how can I know what's the max RAM for my VivoBook X 512DK support? Some pages say eight gigabytes and others say 16. And I can't find it on the individual website. Um, I would recommend check out Crucial. Uh, Crucial has a cool little utility that you can double check and it should be able to go ahead and let you know the maximum RAM. One thing you want to keep in mind with RAM, as long as it's a generally fairly recent laptop, the kind of catch 22 that you sometimes have in terms of memory support is, is that the memory support that might be listed um, might have been only when the product was originally released. And then later, maybe a bigger type of memory module came out, which technically could be supported, but was never qualified. And this is why sometimes you can have conflicting information uh, because essentially the memory came out after the fact, but it doesn't mean that the memory controller and the laptop can't support it. it just means that initially it wasn't part of the type of memory that could be officially validated with the system. So the more important thing with laptops is that when it comes to memory, it's very important to check on three things that one, um, the voltage is going to be a non XMP voltage. There are some DRAM or SODIMs that actually have what are called higher operating voltage to reach a certain speed. And many laptops will not support those correctly. So you will make sure that it doesn't support an overclocked voltage profile. That would be one thing that you would want to keep in mind. Um, and I, I think beyond that also making sure that it's not a higher speed than the laptop can support, because that can also sometimes cause issues with the way that the um, laptop initializes it. But uh, let me quickly see if I can check it for you. If I can check it within a minute, then you know I'll see if I can give you a quick response, but let me try here. I'm going to see if I can find it. If I can't, I, uh, like I said, I would check out Google's website, excuse me, the, the Crucial website. I think they're a great partner that uh, generally has a very good update system. Um, let me see right here. Okay, it brought it up for me right there. Let's see if, if it will load it up for me. So according here to Crucial site, right, uh, you can type in the information. It says that... Uh, yeah, the maximum memory would be 20 gigabytes, right? Um, and one bank, right? And standard four gigabyte non-removable. And then you can see right there that you have the compatible memory. So this looks like, yeah, this is DDR4, 3200, right? Um, you can see that's using the standard voltage. So you have the 1.2 volts. So you can see you've got a 16 gigabyte option, an eight gigabyte option. Um, so the fact that Crucial is already validated the 16 gig, I'd say feel free. If you want to go ahead and drop in a 16 gig, you're good to go. All right, hopefully that answers your question. Um, Nelson's asking, can you daisy chain portable displays? Generally, you cannot daisy chain, but you can have multiple of them attached. If you have a laptop that has multiple display outputs um, that can support that, then you could have multiples connected, but you can't daisy chain the portable displays together, right? We do have that actually on some of our desktop monitors where they can daisy chain from one monitor to another monitor, right? But on terms of a portable display, no, not, uh, not portable, excuse me, not portable daisy chaining. Hi, Miss Kate. Happy to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, um, you see right there, any other questions right there? Miguel is asking right here, will Asus ever build an AI with the choice to do a custom tubing loop instead of a flexible hose? It's something that we've talked about, but um, one of the things that is a challenge in that regard, especially when you work with a partner, so like Asetech is the company that we work with, of course, for all of our current AIOs. So all of them are using the Asetech seventh gen pump. And if we take a look here, like at a pump, I mean, of course, we've got this one right here with the Ryogen 2, right? Um, but when you talk about the actual hoses, one of the big improvements that's come over the last few years is that they actually have a very advanced, actually, um, helium kind of testing system um, that is designed specifically for like off gassing and for actually checking that the actual calibri uh, calibrated actually fit and then the actual pressure within the loop and everything is optimized, right? And so allowing an end user to kind of service this really can affect the viability of kind of ensuring a consistent experience, especially for a long warranty, right? So if you consider right now, a lot of the units right now have like a six year warranty plus on them. Part of the reason why is because they can be optimally tested and calibrated at the production facility. If you were to have it from a DIY perspective, you can't offer that same type of seamless out-of-box experience or that same type of warranty. Now, does this mean that you couldn't do it? Of course not, because in custom water cooling, this is what users do. You put together your own fittings, you, you do it and you get it all set up. Although I can tell you a lot of times, one of the things that I think a lot of videos or guides or people that talk about water cooling always fail to talk about um, is that there's actually a little bit of um, variable actually kind of um, 
resistance that happens when you actually torque your 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 actual screws, right? Well, or your excuse me, not your screws, but your fittings, they'll actually become loose a little bit. Um, so like if you wait like about a day or two days, um, sometimes it can take up to like a week. It just depends. But you actually find that they can actually get a little bit loose. And so generally, you always want to go back like after about like a few days and go back and then retighten it up a little bit. You don't want to over, of course, uh, torque it too much where you could damage it or cause um, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of kinking to your tubing if you're using soft tubing. But it doesn't matter whether you're talking about hard line or where you're talking about soft line. That's something you have to consider. So these things kind of can all be mitigated when you do it in a fully sealed base configuration. But it is something that we've discussed, and I'm not going to say that we've ruled it out. Um, we know that we have a lot of people that would love to see like a custom, like custom pump head or block and then kind of like a way to customize it. So it's something that we've considered. But right now, we don't have any immediate plans to release anything uh, like that. Okay. All right. Um, Dual same master is saying, uh, can we get a 28 to 32 inch gaming monitor for a thousand and fifteen hundred? We already have a lot of monitors in that size at that price point. So unless you're talking about like a specific spec uh, that you may be hoping for, that's very expensive to implement, like Mini LED, which is not realistic for that price point, um, that would be the only thing that I would think be would be the limiting factor, right? All right. Uh, when are we going to get a video on the 42-inch OLED coming soon? Coming soon. Uh, probably September, as I noted earlier. We'll have more information on the ROG Swift OLED monitors uh, coming, okay? All right. Uh, keep your questions coming. If anybody has them, feel free. I'll go ahead and do my best to go ahead and get to them when I can. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and get ready to jump into our PCDIY Builder Spotlight. And uh, we're going to go to our first build right here. This is going to be an all-white build for a friend, I believe. Is this is that, That's what this one's called? This is by Steven, Steven Gutierrez. All right. All right, Steven, let's go ahead and see what you got here. Ooh, all right. Yeah, I'm liking this. I'm liking it. It's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good. So this looks like this is inside a thermal tank based chassis. Um, and it's definitely a white themed build right here. Looking clean looking well executed. Um, you know, it's funny how people always refer to white builds as being clean. I actually find that, I think, almost oxymoronic because I think black can look equally as clean as white, right? In some ways, actually, I think black can look even cleaner. It's actually a little bit more challenging in some ways because it shows off kind of really subtle kind of accents, right? Um, where white actually, oddly enough, because it's so reflective, can really play off the lighting, right? But either which way, it's bold, it's bright, um, it's well laid out in terms of the overall cabling, which is a little bit challenging, I think, within this chassis. Um, you know, some people might wish that this was maybe like a braided comb or, you know, braided extension, right? To just look a little bit cleaner right here. You could also go with the kind of over versus the under base, but this is still very nice. I don't have any kind of issues with this. It's clean, it's well laid out, and, and it's balanced well in terms of the cable management, not the color. Um, right. Um, but overall, I'm definitely digging it. It's nice. And it's a, it's a great looking build. And also, this is an interesting right here, GPU SAG option, right? Um, they are actually using this little kind of attachment, which is kind of interesting. It attaches over here to the chassis and then holds the GPU in play. I might say, I mean, it works because, of course, you have a little bit of black right here is serving as a little bit of contrast. You know, you got the black right here. You've got the black here on the card. You have a little bit of that black on the PCB of the board. So this black actually doesn't look out of place. But, you know, if you wanted to, you know, you could maybe paint it white to kind of maybe have it be a little bit more consistent. Um, but I don't think it's a big thing. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't kind of go through all that effort right there. There's on the front side of the build. Looks good, right? No issues right there. Okay. And there we get a little bit of side profile. That's the one bummer right here. I think a little bit with this open frame is that you've got a lot of extra space here. And that's one of the challenges I think specifically with this chassis is that because it's a bigger chassis and it's almost intended for like a water cooled build, it's a little bit tricky when you have this kind of empty space here, how you end up utilizing it. Right. So, I mean, normally you wouldn't see this that much, but you might, you might want to spend a little bit of time to go ahead and maybe clean up that wiring just a little bit, um, kind of maybe smoothing out. You know, one thing you could maybe do is maybe get yourself like a little mesh and you could med mesh that through and you could tighten that so it could make it seem just like one single type of cable, right? And it would be compressed in. So that could give you a little bit of a cleaned up look for both this side and for kind of this side. So that's a way that you might kind of make that just look a little bit cleaner. But it's again, it's not super critical, right? And you could get extensions also for this cable right here. Um, again, I don't know if it's necessarily worth it in terms of doing it right there if you wanted to add it. But it's overall, it's bold, it's bright, 
well laid out. It gets a thumbs up for me. Steve, solid job in terms of the build. Let's go ahead and take a look at the submission form that we have for this system here. So let me go ahead and bring up the submission form. All right, and I got a submission form right here. Uh, let's go back to, I think, the, the other image. I like that one just a little bit more because I think that's probably the way that you would see it a little bit more kind of person. That's how it would look. All right, so this is, does the build have a theme? All white. Uh, what are the three words to describe your build? Is white, big, and beast. It's definitely a big system, and it's definitely got white present as a theme, and it's definitely beastly when you take a look at the performance that you've got in terms of the hardware. Uh, does the build have a name? All white build for a friend. In terms of the actual core hardware, we've got a Thermaltake Core P6, the Snow Edition, a 12700K. This is a Z690-A Gaming 4. Um, he's then got, uh, let's see... Uh, doesn't say how much memory he has in there in terms of the Vengeance Pro SL memory. Um, a one terabyte 980 PCIe NVMe SSD, and then a one terabyte uh, Samsung 870 for storage. So essentially two terabytes, right? One terabyte for the OS and one terabyte for storage. And ROG Strix 3090 White Edition. Um, and then a Corsair 850 watt power supply. And then that's all cooled by the uh, Thermaltake TH360 ARGB Snow Edition. And then he also has um, multiple Pure 12 ARGB white fans from TT also in there. And then he has a capture card also inside the system. Looks like he's probably doing some streaming, maybe for some gaming. No um, budget was defined right there. What were they most proud of the build? is just being able to get it all put together and up and running. I guess all of us agree, right? When we put it together, we just want to be able to hit that button and have our system work. Is there anything that they would change about the build? Maybe upgrade to a thousand watt power supply. I could see that as having a benefit, especially with the 3090 GPU. It's an OC based model too. Plus you probably might be running overclocked. The transient response on a 3090, you can actually peak over, um, you know, 750 watts, 850 watts. So having actually a thousand watt power supply is nice to just give you that extra comfort, right? Um, how long did it take to put together? About two days and uses it for gaming and streaming. And his favorite feature is going to be Armory Crate. He likes to be able to just monitor a system, tweak and tune his lighting, and be able to have that kind of one-stop shop in terms of everything to manage and monitor a system. Well, you get a definite thumbs up from me, Stephen. Solid build. I like the way it turned out. Let's see. We got any commentary from the group right here. Looks like, um... This is as white as, <laughs> as I've seen so far. Beautiful work of art. Um, yeah, so Snef, actually, that's great. Corsair have white extensions for the USB and for the front panel. Yeah, so that's something you could actually add in there specifically. Um, Pidgey PC says, yeah, I like the white. Let's see. Um, just go ahead and see here. Uh, I have a question right here. Which ROG router do you recommend for wireless gaming? Ideal for more than one device. Really, actually, any router is going to be fine for more than one device. You know, um, a lot of the modern routers that we have, especially once you go to at least a tri-core or quad-core based processor, you're going to easily be able to handle, you know, uh, 20, 40, you know, 50 plus devices, right? Um, really what it comes down to more so is going to then just be the number of, I think, bands that you want to have available and then the coverage, right? And the coverage could really vary. Like, are you in a 600 square foot apartment or are you in like my house here, you know, where you maybe have to cover up to like 20, 100 square feet, maybe the backyard, you know, your patio and maybe two stories, right? So that could be a lot more variable. Um, overall, kind of like my go-to recommendation for a lot of users is going to be the RT. Uh, AX82U or the 86. I think those are two really great models that we have. If you've got a little bit more budget, maybe consider the GT AX6000, but those would be three models that can all really handle a large number of units, have great performance. You've got some options right there if you wanted to be able to also have support for 2.5 gigabit networking, um, not only for the LAN, but also for the WAN. So maybe if you upgrade to a faster ISP in the future, and all of those models can also support mesh Wi-Fi. So that means if you ever wanted more coverage, you could just add a second model and combine them together to be able to give you really, really far ranging coverage and really be able to give you great signal strength for a high number of devices. Um, but if you do go mesh, I do always try to recommend if you can put in your budget, consider tri band uh, versus dual band, but definitely dual band can still give you a great experience. All right. All right, um, let's go and get ready to go into our next build here. And I'll take a look at questions in a second. I know see that we got some other ones that popped up, but just let me get ready to get our other build up in here and we will keep moving things along. So our next one is going to be a cool mod that we have from Patrick Nolte. And this is gonna be the Bumblebee PC. 
All right. I think I remember when I saw this one. This one was pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. And uh, before we go ahead and load that one up, let me go ahead and just bring up his submission form. So I have that ready. And I've got that ready. Going to get his images up here. Okay, cool. And let me go ahead and just see uh, what are the questions we have there. Um, Lex is noting, I noticed that the product page for the port, uh, the PG, excuse me, the PG for, <laughs> for the RG Swift OLED 42, uh, does not mention the 900 nits, uh, peak brightness. So will it be able to get as bright as the 48 advantage variant? Um, I'll have to double check. That could just be maybe that we haven't updated it as last time I checked. Um, the actual specifications should be pretty similar in terms of that regard. Um, they both have the same type of overall heatsink design. We've been actually doing some updating to be, it potentially actually included some uh, thermal analysis to the actual management of how we actually are maximizing actually the brightness for these monitors. So it could be just we haven't updated that information. So just make sure to watch those product pages. And as I noted, when we get ready to get the closer to the actual formal launch, we'll have the updated pages completely in play for both the 42 and for the 40 inch. And like I said, we'll also have a dedicated stream that will go through all of the specifications specifically for the monitor to be able to talk about all the elements on how we're trying to maximize the performance, especially when it comes to the brightness. Because with our thermal design, that's one of the key benefits that we have compared to the televisions. It's not only being able to achieve a higher brightness, but able to sustain a higher brightness, right? And not have so many of the concerns that you have with ABL as well. So definitely make sure to keep it tuned. We'll have more information in that, okay? Um, J, excuse me, J, JGF is saying, do you think there's a particular brand of DDR5 that is least fussy with Asus motherboards? No, um, I don't think that there's actually a preferred brand. Um, we did a great stream recently um, with Micron, also another one with Kingston. Now, I'm going to have actually a dedicated DDR5 overview video where I'll actually be talking about things like IMC quality, how that affects DDR5 scaling, um, uh, you know, how to actually um, account for variability in terms of IMC quality. If you buy a high speed kit and your IMC can't support it and how to drop dividers, um, how to account for things like um, DRAM density, population, and IC, and how that plays around with like two DIM to four DIM configurations and, and different things along those lines. Um, my recommendation though, is that, you know, it could be team group, it could be Patriot, it could be Kingston, it could be G-Skill, um, you know, any one of those partners, they all make fantastic memory um, and they're all going to be compatible. The big thing is actually going to be more so that you have to really be cognizant of rank and density and then the speed. So and our kind of analysis generally about if you took 10 CPUs, um, I would say on average, approximately about 80% of those CPUs are going to be able to hit a 6000 MT memory divider, right? Because keep in mind that the default memory divider for a 12th gen series CPUs is 4,800 MT, right? Anything over than that is an overclock speed, right? So it's not so much about the memory being fussy. It's about the fact that you don't know the quality of your MyMC. Because you could have maybe one or two of those CPUs, like I talked about, or maybe even three, right? Because if it's like 70, 80%, it could be up to like three CPUs that don't even want to run a 6,000 MT memory divider, right? The motherboard, the UEFI, the RAM doesn't have anything to do with that. It's all the memory controller. And sometimes users have that really hard understanding that they sometimes they don't even want to accept it. And they can't, it's hard for them to understand it because if you don't have multiple CPUs to test, then how do you even know that the CPU is your limiting factor, right? But that's why I tell people, be cautious. Once you break 6,000 MT, you're really going into a variable that your um, likelihood that your memory controller is going to be able to support that actually starts to go down a bit more and goes down a bit more. So like here, you know, if you, I have these Kingston kits, these are great. Um, if you went with like a 62 or a 6400, you could have more variability. But I can also show you um, here. Let me show you. Uh, do I still have them? I think I, still, I think I should probably still have them. Do I have them right here? Yeah. So like here, I can show you this. This right here. Um, so this is already showing you here. Here's 6200, right? This is running on. What is this? This is running on. This is running on the stream board. Here's 6,000, right, running on the extreme also, right? But then here is 6,400, right? And this is running on the Hero. So that's 6,400, but this is an IMC that I know can run it, right? And then here's also 6,400 running on a B660-I. Here's 6,400 running on the uh, Z690 Creator board, right? Here's 6,400 running on the Prime Dash A board, right? All 1,000, you know, excuse me, one uh, fully stable, one hour full OCC-based stress test, right? Um, so 
it's not an issue really on our part in terms of on the board. We've done a huge amount of work in terms of the topology and the UEFI to be able to support it. Just be mindful of the memory. So um, I would recommend don't go over 6,000 MT unless you're prepared to manually set your memory divider because your CPU doesn't support that. So if you bought like 62, 64, 66, you could definitely run into the likelihood that your CPU doesn't support that. And of course, this is going to be in two dim configurations. And also keep in mind that density affects that, right? So 64 gigs is always going to be harder than 32 gigs as well. So proportionally, that percentage goes down as well. All right. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. There's a lot that we went into right there. Um, so let's go ready to go into the next one. Uh, McGill saying, I was looking at Kingston. No, Kingston, we did a whole stream on it. Go back and check that stream. We have a stream that we showed actually Kingston. These right here, these are Kingston uh, DRAM right here. They have RGB. So yeah, it's under their, they have the Kingston Fury Beast and then they also have the Kingston Renegade. So both of those, they actually have RGB. The only thing to keep in mind is that right now, Armory Crate does not support the RGB control for it. It's not like Corsair where we do not have access support where Corsair won't give us API access for native control. You have to use IQ and then you can have it sync and you know, be able to work. Kingston, we will, we are working with them to get uh, the essentially API implemented Armory Crate, but it probably won't be out until the end of Q3. Um, but you can still use the Fury control software in the interim. So if you do buy Kingston kits, they're fantastic. They work great, no problems, but the RGB memory management control won't be in place until probably the end of Q3. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's go into the uh, next build right here. So this is going to be the Bumble PC. All right. Oh, no, wrong, <laughs> wrong image here. Let me go right here. Sorry. Um, here we go. Bumble PPC. All right. So, oh, wow. This looks pretty cool. This is this has got a lot going on right here. So we've got Demon Slayer going on. Hey, remember Demon Slayer hardware is going to be coming next, next month. Next month, guys. If you guys are interested in Demon Slayer, it'll be out next month. But we've got a Prime motherboard in here. Uh, we've got a Tough Gaming graphics card. It looks like we got um, a 12th gen system in there but we got some heavy modding going on there's a lot that's going on here that's pretty interesting so we got a vertical card we've got a lot of little accents right here yellow so if you guys don't know yellow and orange are my personal favorite colors so i'm always excited when i get to see kind of a yellow and orange build right here um this is overall really cool we can definitely see that we've got the bumblebee from the movie uh that's kind of been an inspired reference right here so let's keep looking at this already this is really cool it's always really exciting to see kind of creative really interesting builds and kind of inspirations um so We've got the Tough Gaming graphics card. It looks like they definitely took the shroud off and they did some custom um, kind of paint right here to it. Uh, maybe a little bit thick on that paint right there, but um, overall still cool. You definitely get the motif coming through in terms of the yellow. I like that they actually brought in the Autobots little matrixing right there. They kept the Tuffet Gaming ID. Did a nice job at least sparing the uh, radio, excuse me, the Axial Tech fans that we have on there because you don't want to actually paint your fans generally because that could actually change the the access performance and some of the uh, static pressure performance of the fans. So you can definitely do stuff in terms of the shroud, although keep in mind that does avoid your warranty. Um, but this is a very cool kind of customization right there. Um, love the kind of little accents right here with the, with again, the kind of the stat panel, the Camaro right there. looks like they've also customized the cooler. You got some nice high quality be quiet fans that are going to be in there. A nice pop there with the RGB lighting, maybe a little bit right here where you could have added maybe some sheathing to just this little cabling right there, just to reduce that. But I don't know. In some way, it kind of feels a little bit transformist to maybe see the wires, right? Maybe it doesn't need to be clean. Cause like, I mean, if it's a big old robot, you know, you'd expect to see all that machinery and all that wires anyway. So I don't know, maybe in a weird way that actually kind of works, right? Um, that's kind of cool right here. They added in a speaker. Uh, the speaker is pretty cool. Uh, I like that. That's a nice little level of customization right there. And then over here, we got more of the little Autobots going on in the back right there. Yeah, and definitely here we can see, of course, the customization also on that. Wow, they even painted the heat sinks. Uh, they added the actual paint right there to the heat sinks. I'm wondering if that's actually maybe like a vinyl that they cut off or if it's actually paint. I don't know. Maybe we'll see in the submission form. And then here in the front, that's really cool. You can definitely see the front is really, I think, the star of the show, of course. And that's really interesting because if you remember the very beginning image, if we go back, that's so cool. So it's a functional mod. So these are always the really coolest to see where it's actually like a mod that works in a way, right? So you can see Bumblebee's face fully exposed, right? And then Bumblebee when he's armored up, right? And then when he's ready to, you know, he's ready to jump in and fight. So that's a really cool kind of aesthetic 
uh, that it's functional element to be able to design like that. Top looks really nice right there too. And with this chassis, that's also cool too, because you should be able to remove that, of course, if you want to maximize still the airflow. It's a really cool mod. There's a lot of attention to detail that's been put in here, a lot of work um, in terms of what has been applied here. So kudos in terms of the time and effort. This is definitely, you can tell, an undertaking. It's a, it's a labor of love and a passion project to be able to kind of do everything that was done here. So very, very, very cool. So Michael gives it a uh, very vibrant colors. Uh, great job. Hey, Tim, happy to have you here on the stream. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Sean saying nice Camara sign. Uh, PGPC's holy yellow. <laughs> I like that though. System looks good. Uh, nice mod. Zoom in. Gives us a wow, wow, wow. And Sunday Superfly says uh, totally Bumblebee, right? I would totally agree. Um, was Ski is asking about the laptop specs. There's no uh, Demon Slayer laptop. Uh, everything that we talked about for Demon Slayer, you can actually go check out I think, is it last week's or the week before the last live stream for all the components that we'll be releasing in Asus North America for the Demon Slayer collab, right? All right. Um, let's go ahead and take a look here at their Builder's uh, Spotlight submission form. Give me one second here. And I will bring this up right here. Okay, there we go. And uh, let me bring up the images again here. Sorry. I think we'll settle on, let's keep on that primary. I think that primary is a good kind of reference right there for their um, their system. Okay, so this should be from Patrick Nolte. Um, and this was actually a sponsored build. Uh, the build have a theme, Bumblebee. Three words to describe the build was Epic Transformers build, Bumblebee PC mod. Uh, the core components that we have on here, an Asus B660 Prime, a 12600K, 16 gigabytes of memory, Viper, uh, memory, uh, a Sabernet Rocket uh, 4 Plus 500 gigabyte drive, um, then a 850 watt power supply that's in there, uh, Tough Gaming uh, 3070 base graphics card, and then Be Quiet Silent Base uh, 802, and then Be Quiet Silent Loop uh, 2 280 AIO, and then uh, a couple of uh, the uh, Be Quiet Silent Wings fans 4. Overall budget was just a bit, a little bit under about $2,400. What were they most proud of is the electromechanic mask, a bumblebee that moves with the sound driver by an Arduino unit. Oh, that's really cool. So uh, we don't have a little video of that, but I guess actually it like moves and closes with actually some sound. That's really, really cool. That, that just, that just takes it up a notch and get even an extra thumbs up. That's pretty sweet. Is there anything that they would change about the build? No. How long did it take to build the system? Uh, for all the mounts and the mods, about one month, which definitely, I think, and the time and the effort to be able to customize. I don't know if there was printing that was involved, probably some 3D printing work, then all the painting, right? All the accent customizations, all the little pieces in there. That's actually quite impressive in terms of getting all that done in the month. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, what did you use? What's the system used for? So it's a Windows 10 system um, did you use for gaming. So some stuff like Resident Evil 3 Remake, Dying Light 2. Um, and then also checking out some some uh, videos and things online. Uh, favorite Asus feature or function? He's a big fan of the Asus UEFI BIOS. It's simple and it's fast, um, and I would agree. Definitely a great overall experience. Uh, overall, man, you get definitely a thumbs up from me, man, Patrick. Nice job. It's a it's a cool build, definitely distinct. And I think visually, always the big thing you want within a mod is you want to be able to take away the theme and have a clear sense of it, and you definitely do that, man. So nice job there. All right. Very, very cool. Okay. So let's go ahead and go into our next build here. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and see what we got. All right. Um, we're going to go to, I think we got a really simple one. And then a couple others right here. All right. This is going to be Lucy From Harris. All right, let's go ahead and check this one out right here. We got only one image. Normally, we usually ask for people to submit uh, a little bit more than that when they do have a build, but that's all they went ahead and submitted. So we'll go ahead and see what we have here. Oh, still does a nice job to let us know what we got going on here. Okay, um, pretty cool, pretty cool. So we got looks like a classic kind of chassis right now in terms of very popular, uh, but we got a blacked out vibe. I'm liking it. So this is very nicely done. Uh, of course, we have a massive amount of those Noctua 
uh, Chromax base fans in there. We got, of course, the ROG Strix board, the uh, original Ryujin, not the Ryujin 2, and then ROG Strix uh, graphics card that we have in there. Nice braided combs right there in terms of these look like nylon base uh, cables right there. So they have a nice little bit of sheen to them. I think it plays well with the same kind of sheen that you have on the tubing that you have also on the Ryujin 2. You can tell this this build, it's going to look good when the lighting comes on. It being all black, you could easily go through and have like a color gradient. Or you could also just go with blue. You could go with green. You could go with pink. You could go with purple. It wouldn't matter. It would always look great because you have black as that base. It would be fantastic. So really easy to work with. But clean, well laid out. Execution is on point. I've got nothing to niggle on this. I mean, this is this is a nice overall setup. Um, you know, it's going to be clean, functional, well laid out. Um, you know, I would have loved to see what it would have looked like turned on, but you know, we didn't get that. So uh, we'll have to go with what we've got right here. So let's see here. Uh, so this is going to be. Uh, does the build have a theme? Yes, actually, the build was ROG. Three words used to describe the build is overkill silent and gorgeous i think it's a great system uh in terms of its overall look and feel and definitely i would say with all these chromax fans especially if you got a nice tuned fan curve yeah it should definitely actually be well cooled but quiet um does the build have a name lucy uh, he says uh lucy i'm home is mandatory every time i come home <laughs> In terms of the core hardware, we've got a 5900X and X570-F gaming board, and uh, uh, then an ROG Strix RTX 3080, uh, Ryujin 360, 32 gigabytes of memory, and then only the uh, NF12, excuse me, the NF512 IPPC based fans. So the IPPC based fans are actually not the Chromax, but they're the actual uh, industrial versions of an Akua fans. They have them in two different RPM levels. Fantastic fans. They're built great very good performance. They're generally going to be a little bit more static pressure optimized than they are going to be for airflow for a chassis fan, but you know, they definitely still get the job done. And of course you can't uh, knock the Noctua quality. They're a great partner and great choice for cooling. Um, what was the budget for the build? About $3,400. Uh, they're most proud of just the noise levels. I guess how quiet the system is. Is there anything they would change about the build? Maybe in the future, look to upgrade to RTX 4000 series when they come out. Um, how long did it take to build your system? Uh, about two, two, two to three hours with cable management. And then a system is predominantly used for sim racing, GTA Online, RTS games like Command, uh, Command, uh, excuse me, Command and Conquer. Uh, awesome. Age of Empires. Awesome. Uh, and some Fall Guys. Uh, none of these games need a 3080, but here we are. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's when you start using um, a dynamic super resolution and stuff like that, right? You know, so, you know, you start to really max out all that image quality as much as possible, right? And drive that smooth frame rate. Um, so uh, favorite ASUS kind of feature or function, they're a really big fan of just the overall performance of our kind of design when it comes to the thermal solution, especially on our graphics cards. It's cool, it's quiet, and it's fast. Um, overall, man, thumbs up. It's a nice job, Harris. You definitely did my kind of build. Uh, this is definitely something that I would probably be putting together myself. So very cool. Let's see if we've got um, any feedback right there. PGPCs gives us a very clean. Nocturial industri uh, industrials be like, yep, quite and deadly like the Black Widow. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um um, I like that, Michael. You have some planning to do. Um, and Michael gives us a simple and nice, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I would have loved to be able to just see some colors on it, just be able to see it pop a little bit, right? Cool and old school black, right? Yeah, very cool. All right, uh, let's go ahead and go over into our next build. All right, I'm going to go, I think we've got uh, two more. So we've got one over for Pidgey PCs, and then we've, uh, we're have we going to go back and cover the one that we didn't do because it was my fault. I didn't have it ready, but um, Sneff's build um, in terms of his AP201 system. So uh, we're going to be having CNE coming up shortly. So if you're over in Canada and you're close by and you want to come check out uh, these awesome builds, make sure to go ahead and check out the ASUS booth. You'll have the opportunity to see these builds in person from the one, the only, the master class builder himself. Mr. Sniff. So let's go ahead and take a look at this beautiful build. I don't have a submission form to go over it, but um, if Sniff's here, hopefully maybe he can give us some, some of the details um, and let us know what's going on on there. But um, I wanted to make sure to go ahead and touch on this one. So last week we took a look at his scratch build. So this is actually the one that he put together in our brand new AP201 micro ATX chassis. So it's a fantastic, beautiful build. So let's go ahead and take a look at it here. Oh, this is such a good looking build. All right. 
Here we go. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one right there. Um, all right. So already right off the bat, Sneff already is killing it as always with his color theory. His color theory is really um, on point. It's one of my favorite things about him as a builder is that he really, I think, thinks a lot about the color theory and the balance of how things play off with each other. So having white, you're going to have naturally a really kind of nice reflective base material. It's going to give you a little bit of that pop and help things come out, right? And so here you can see uh, that choice to go with the gold and then the purple, absolutely fantastic choice. And purple also another one of my favorites um, in terms of the overall colors when it's present within a build. Um, and also I'm a really big fan of gold. We don't see a lot of gold in builds. Um, it's a natural accent to white and to black, and it works great, but it just doesn't get used a lot. Um, but here we can see, of course, the kind of attention to detail that Sniff brings to the table. So we can see beautiful little accents like right here. Look at the actual screws uh, that we have right there with gold. Beautiful cabling right there with, of course, that nice white and then the purple and then the gold right there. And then, of course, you can see the gold carried through right there all throughout, which looks beautiful. Um, and then I don't know if these are the um, if Sniff would let us know right here, but I think these are the brand new EK gold plated um, uh, items that they just recently came out with. So they look beautiful right there. Really, again, showing off a great kind of symmetry to be able to show off some nice pop and some nice contrast. And of course, we can see right here, um, even though it's a micro ATX chassis, it's got a nice lot of room to be able to play with. So we can see right here. Went with a more compact board, but then customized, of course, distro right here, which gets integrated. Really nice cable management all laid out in there, but fantastic looking. And now here, we brighten it up with, of course, some fantastic uh, lighting right there. Oh, Snap is right here. Uh, so he goes, more bends than I do usually. Yeah, so actually, normally, a lot of times, Sneff has really kind of had that balance at not doing that many runs sometimes. It's sometimes, I think, simplicity in forms of giving you minimal routes, but some nice, clean bends right there, as we would expect. I like these little kind of accents. They're cool right here, right? Just kind of pulling back here inside, going right here, still giving us some nice visibility right here. Nice run down to the bottom and then directly over the back of the graphics card. This is one that actually you don't really see that often. A lot of times people are going out and under. It's a nice use of space within the chassis, I think, in terms of this layout and choice. I like the way that this turned out. And that goal just looking on point. And again, the, the cool thing here is you can definitely see a lot of room in there to be able to play around with this. So this uh, chassis actually allows you to support up to a full 360 rad in here. I don't know, is it? It does look like it's a 360 in there, Sniff. Um, but you've got a lot of flexibility. You can do a 240 or you can do a 360 in there. You can fit 240, uh, excuse me, uh, fans down here at the bottom, as you see, that were implemented in there. There, The fan in the back, of course, the room there for the customization on the distro, which is a nice touch as well. Oh, and there we go with the with the light. So he just we just went we just we just took it up. We just just took it up, right? Uh, there we go. So yes. Uh, so yes, Sneff says um, that's correct. It's uh, at the 360 that's in there. Yes, and this is also the AP201. This is the white version. So we have it in two versions. The AP201 will be available in black, and it will be available in white. What does everybody think on the color? I love the color. He's been killing it lately with the color schemes. Um, I think beautiful. I really love the white playing around in here at just giving you a little bit of a nice kind of pop and color, a little bit of drama, a little bit of playfulness. Um, I don't know, but I'm torn. Like I really love with actually no lighting. It looks really, really nice, but I also really like it with the color. So it's almost maybe like daytime, nighttime, right? Daytime, nighttime. I think that's the way that I would probably do it. I really like the way that it comes out too. Um, so uh, this is our, uh, Brandon Potter. This is our MM ATX chassis. So this is the Asus AP201. So we will be releasing this probably. It should maybe be available before the end of the month. Uh, hopefully maybe if not a little bit sooner, but we will have this chassis. We'll have the white version and we'll have the black version. We announced this in our prior PCIe hardware stream. So the black will be a little bit cheaper than the white. Uh, I think the white's $85 and the black will be, uh, $79. So essentially 80 or $85, but either one. And they are micro ATX chassis. So, uh, Nelson says, uh, it's a heart for the RGB done right. Uh, uh, Sunday Superfly says, gorgeous. And then boom, goes the dynamite. Yep, uh, I definitely agree. Yeah, it's beautiful. Sneff's build never disappoints, right? Yeah, uh, this is the brand new EK stuff. So this is the gold-plated EK blocks uh, and accent hardware that we have in there. So it uh, looks fantastic, yeah. And I really love the Team Team Force Delta memory. They have really some of the nicest diffusion on their kits. 
I love the diffusion block that you have right there on the EK block. Looks really, really nice there too. And then of course, these I believe are all the EK Vidar fans that you also have in there, which are really nice fans. And they're nice too, because they're not proprietary. They're not like, you know, like an IQ uh, kind of Corsair LL fan or something like that. So they can just be go into a standard RGB fan splitter or a hub like that. And they could still be linked in with the motherboard. So you could control them through Armory Crate. So um, really nice option. And then this is the other really cool thing that I think I love about the AP201. Um, the AP201 um, has what we call this quasi mesh filter. It's really fine. So there's 57,000 per perforations on this. And so while it doesn't have tempered glass, you can actually see how you can almost still see through the chassis, right? So the lighting almost gives you this really kind of cool effect that you can see the chassis and its visibility. And I think it's really, really cool uh, design aesthetic. I love the way that it looks. I love the way that the color comes on into play in there. Um, and you still get a great thermal experience. Now, regardless here, even if you didn't, you'd have a great thermal experience because of so much um, you know, water cooling in there, but it still has a really cool vibe to it that I really like, almost like a little bit of kind of a diffuse aesthetic to it that is really, really nice, right? All right. Um, Let's see, the lit version has some intergalactic, interdimensional feels to it, right? Um, Sneff gives it a thumbs up. He says, really a great case. He loves it a lot. And thank you so much, Sneff. That's big words coming from you. Sneff has had the opportunity to probably work with, I think, probably every premier chassis on the market for, <laughs> I don't know, maybe the last, you know, uh, you know, five to seven years, um, you know, consistently. So uh, having a modern builder like him has really been able to work with so many different chassis. I think if he gives a thumbs up and he says he likes a chassis, that for me counts a lot in terms of it really showing you that it's a great chassis to be able to build in and have a nice experience. And so thank you so much for that feedback. And again, Sneff, Man, hats off to you. You killed it. It's a fantastic build. It looks great. And I think it's a great way for us to be able to show off what is possible with the AP201. Um, really, really a fantastic looking build. All right. Uh, so that is uh, an amazing build from the one, the only Sneff, the masterclass builder himself. All right, so let's get ready to go ahead and wrap things up right here. We've got one from uh, Pidgey PCs wrapping up the stream. It looks like Yellow. We've had actually a little bit of moment for Yellow, which has been pretty cool. Always really nice to be able to see Yellow um, be featured in our builds. So this is going to be the caution from Pidgey PCs. I love the way that this build turned out. It's a really cool kind of mix of kind of a little bit of kind of really some nice custom color theory um, at play. Nice, clean, laid out management on the build as far as kind of the cables, the components, how it was all kind of wrapped up. Um, really nice, nice and nicely done. So let's go ahead and take a closer look here. All right. So here you guys go. You can see it right off the bat. Really love the way that this build actually turned out in terms of the overall color theory. So it's actually bringing together a lot of the colors that I love. So we've got, you know, black, we've got then the yellow, and then we have, of course, the purple. And that's a great just kind of three-way color scheme and combination. And I think he nailed it in terms of the balance in terms of each one of the colors where we're using this GT501. This is the Demon Slayer Edition GT501. And he got this, I believe he actually got the import. So he paid more than he should have because he wanted to build this project and he imported in this chassis um, as opposed to when we'll sell it, we'll have it sold directly here in North America soon. Um, but this is the Demon Slayer Edition GT501, which has that really cool yellow accent to it. It also has a USB-C port on it, which is different than the standard GT501. And then from there, you can see some really nice just touches in terms of kind of bringing together kind of the thematic elements. So some nice cables right here that look beautiful in terms of the black, then the purple, then the yellow. Uh, then I really love the touch right here to go with the bridge combs. These look like they're probably the anodized uh, purple accents, which I think really nice. And normally, um, I think Royals only work in certain type of builds really well, but I really actually like the way that the Royals worked in here, just giving a little bit of kind of pop, a little bit of dazzle, almost like mirroring kind of the little lightning effect that you have here, I think actually worked really well. So I, I'm a fan actually of how the Royals worked out right here. The Strix LC, which again, this is the LC2, which has a little bit of that glyphed uh, design too, which I think also ties together with a little bit of that kind of subtle sparkiness that we're seeing here with the lightning motif, the Herculix in there. And then the Land Lee fans that are in there with that beautiful, nice kind of dual um, RGB lighting design that they have, where they have the infinity display right there. Then, of course, the centralized LED on the inside. Then, of course, the hub pattern and then that accent line, which I think all of those lines play really, really well here. So I really like the way that this build turned out. 
So let's go ahead and uh, take a look here and see what we've got. So um, this is also a nice touch here. This is actually a little bit of mix, right? So they're right here, GPU wise, he's got the EVA edition based graphics card in the build as opposed to, um, you know, let's say our standard card. But the great thing about the EVA edition is I love this customized ARGB light pattern we did in there. I think it really complements the look and feel of the build. And then we've also got the purple, which is of course really one of the key colors with the EVA edition. I like even still that you kept the green in there, even though green's not part of it, you don't feel that it detracts from anything in there. And it still gives you that little call out to the uh, RTX, right? That it is an RTX based graphics card. Side profile looks on point. Cable management done really cleanly, really nice. It also shows off the fact that I still love the GT501. It's one of my favorite chassis in the market. I know a lot of people like that kind of split frame chassis, but I like the identity of the GT501. I think it's a really easy chassis to work in. You know, we offer it in black, white, the Demon Slayer edition, um, right? And so a lot of different choices in terms of the GT501. Great for water cooling, great for air cooling. Great for a lot of different type of build configurations, a lot of room, very easy to work within. And it's not expensive. It's only about $100, um, you know, for the uh, for the standard GT501. The Demon Slayer is a little bit more expensive, of course, because it's a special edition chassis. And here we can see it with RGB lighting off. Um, you can definitely feel, I think that the lighting definitely elevates it, props it up a bit, but still nice, very clean, uh, really nicely laid out. Great job on the cable management, nice and, and nicely managed right there. He's got zip ties. I'm always a fan of Velcro uh, or hook and loop fasteners as opposed to zip ties, but zip ties definitely get it done. And I know they're faster than Velcro, that's for sure. Or hook and loop. I love the straps. I love the straps. The straps are so cool. Great shot right there to be able to include those. So let's go ahead and take a look there at the submission form. Um, I'm going to leave it there at the front. I think this is a really nice shot right here of the build. Let's see. They can take a look and see what we've got. So we got nice cable work, right? Uh, uh, that's definitely, yep. That's uh, definitely would approve of this build. Uh, we got a definite thumbs up. Beautiful build over from Zoom In. Um, the purple is a subdued shade to not take away from the yellow. I definitely agree. Um, and Snef, wow, nice call out from Snef. That's what I call clean. I like uh, uh, the color co color scheme. Yeah, definitely, I would agree. Um, beautiful, tough, great color scheme. Michael gives a uh, definite a wow right there, and uh, Miguel giving us yeah, Ben. So Ben, that would be Ben Whalen, uh, who is PGPCs. Let's go ahead and take a look here at the submission form. So <clears throat> let's see. Oh, I, we actually, let me see. I can probably bring up the, let me see if I can bring up the video right there. Yeah. So let's do that. Give me one second here. All right. We'll do that. And I think I already um, gave that one. So we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that right there. Give me one second. I got to get rid of the ads. We don't want any ads right here. But you guys can definitely go ahead and check out. Make sure to go ahead and subscribe to PGPCs. We already threw him a subscribe. We also threw him a like there. Uh, but you can try to check out. He's got just his YouTube channel. He just went ahead and started. Um, and he'll take you through that. It's a really cool little build guide um, because it actually shows you through some of the nice actually aspects of the, the products. Uh, going through the actual build process. A nice little time lapse right there where you can see it actually all come together, which is cool. I think it's always nice to be able to sometimes just see time lapses, be able to see how kind of people approach uh, the build process and the build experience. So it's been cool to be able to see that type of process and see it all kind of come through in the final form that we saw right there. So definitely you guys can go ahead and check it out. Um, we'll leave it right there while I go ahead and take a look at the submission form. Let me see right here. So uh, let me see. This is going to be, uh, sorry, where do I have, did I? Have the submission form? Okay, <laughs> one second. I will leave that right there for a moment while I uh, bring up the submission form. So give me one sec here. I went ahead and removed it. There we go. Okay. Don't make it too hard on yourself, JJ. All right, here we go. So uh, there we go. And let's see here. So uh, this is going to be... 
does the build have a theme? Limited edition. Uh, three words to describe the build is clean, custom, and unique. Uh, does the build have a name? The Caution. And so core hardware we have in here is this is going to be a Z590-based system. So Maximus Z590 Hero, an 11900K that's in there, an ROG Strix LC2, the 360 edition. Um, we have then the G-Skill Trident RGB uh, memory that's going to be in there. That's going to be the Royal-based edition that's in there. And let's go back here to our system. Uh, one terabyte in terms of the primary OS drive and then a two terabyte drive in terms of the game drive. So one's going to be a Samsung 980 Pro and then a Sabernet Rocket Q uh, for the game drive. And then the RTX 3080 EVA edition based graphics card, a Strix 850 watt power supply. That's all inside of the GT501. Um, of course, Demon Slayer based chassis. Lanley fans is the SL120 Infinities, uh, seven of them. And then the mainframe custom supplies for the actual cables were hand built uh, by him. So fantastic. Yeah. So mainframe customs, fantastic supplier. If you guys are looking to be able to get, be able to pick some absolutely premium base cable sleeving, um, they're a great choice. And if you're looking for something on that side, the budget for the build was about $3,800 altogether. Um, and then what were they most proud of is, of course, the custom cables. I think those look fantastic. And they really helped to elevate the overall build. Looks great. Is there anything they would change about the build? Nope. How long did it take to put it together? Uh, about 15 hours from overall start to finish, right? And keep in mind, that work for the cables does not come easy. Your hands are going to hurt, and it's going to take some time. Um, so... Uh, the wife will use the PC for gaming. She plays The Sims 4, so she'll be purchasing her uh, herself an ROG 4K uh, monitor to be able to do her gaming sessions on The Sims 4. That's pretty cool. And then uh, she'll also be playing the upcoming Hogwarts Legacy game. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, very cool. And then his overall favorite feature function is definitely Armory Crate. It's a one-stop shop, right? Especially with this board, you may be able to monitor your temperatures, your clock speeds, enable AI overclocking, do your fan tuning, all right? Be able to change your RGB lighting, be able to turn it off, do scenario profiles and all that great stuff. Um, you did a fantastic job. Ben, you killed it. Great build, great showcase. Um, I think it turned out fantastic. So thank you so much, man. So that uh, takes care of that. All right. So very, very cool. Um, PG is saying, yeah, lots of blisters on the fingertips. All right, guys. Well, that wraps up our PC DIY stream for this week. As always, thank you guys so much for joining us uh, with that. Take care. Take it easy. Enjoy your guys' Friday. Stay safe. Stay healthy. If you're going to be building, if you're going to be upgrading, best of luck. And hopefully you guys will be checking us out and joining us in the HG's PC DIY group. If you're not there, make sure to go ahead and check us out. It's linked in the description. So with that, take care. Take easy. And we'll see you.